morning class. Can you hear me? Okay, I can't hear myself very well. Probably just as well. Uh, indeed, I am happy to have an opportunity to come to class and to sit and be a partaker of the things that our Heavenly Father Yahweh has graciously bestowed upon us through his son, Yahshua the Messiah. Uh, this is quite an experience for me, as I am sure it is for you. And I would hope that Yahweh would allow us to glean the best parts of the things that are going on here and not be very much persuaded by the logistics and the difficulties that are involved. Now, <clears throat> the first aim of this school is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and as he actually exists. Now, when we think about that being the first aim, then we have to look at why would that be necessary? You see, why would it be necessary for us to know our Heavenly Father? Don't we already know him? You see? And then, as far as it's concerned, what makes your opinion or the truth any different from my opinion, how I feel about it, what's in my heart? You know, in other words, what is the purpose, you see, for which Yahweh has bestowed this mercy on us? See? Get uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and 16 and John 4 and 24, please. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3 and 16. So, okay. For Yahweh's spirit. Now Yahweh is that spirit. Okay, now here in the version of the Bible that she is reading. It says Yahweh is that spirit. But as the moderator has expressed to you, Yahweh is pure spirit. And as they have him pictured as a red fiery cloud here on this chart, and everything on the chart is in the cloud, that is to help us understand, you see, that everything in the whole creation, the universe itself, exists within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now, if we could just conceive of the great expanse of that, we ought to realize that we couldn't comprehend it. When we go to these cities such as Dallas or these metroplexes as they call them, you drive around the city and it just seems incomprehensible how much area is covered, how much concrete has been poured out there. Now when you think about the universe, then you have to realize that there, if Yahweh was tangible, you still could not perceive of him in that great expanse. But because he is spirit, then we have a greater problem because we are physical. All our senses detect physical phenomena. There is no way for us to know anything about spirit with our physical eyes, with our physical ears, with our tactile senses of touch. You see, there's nothing that we can know about Yahweh in that way, see, because he is spirit, and that is the definition of spirit. See, he's intangible, he's incomprehensible, you see, indiscernible, you see all those big words. They say you can't know it, you see. Now read John 4, 24. John 4, 24. Uh-huh. For Yahweh is spirit, mm -hmm. and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Are you reading that from the Holy Name Bible? Okay, I, one, of, one of the Bibles I have says Elohim is spirit. Is that right? Okay, Elohim is spirit. Now Yahweh, see, when we talk about these names, they denote the Heavenly Father in that pure spirit state of source and substance, being the limits and bounds of all things. Now it says that Yahweh, knowing that we could not perceive of him in that pure spirit state, he took on a shape and form. Now this shape and form was known as Elohim, see, which we have denoted here as the word or son, see. But now it says that Elohim is spirit, see. So once again, we have the same problem with Yahweh Elohim that we have with Yahweh in his pure spirit state. We're still dealing with spirit, see? So how are we going to know anything about Yahweh as he really is and as he actually exists, see? Now, this is a Bible school, and we use the Bible. And there's a place in the Bible that we have to start to get an understanding. Give me Isaiah 8 and 20. Isaiah 8 and 20. Mm -hmm. To the law and to the testimony. Now here the prophet Isaiah writes, to the law and to the testimony. 
So now what is the law and the testimony? When I came into this class, I didn't know that. See? The law is the first five books of the Bible. See, attributed to Moses. And the testimony are the prophets. You see? That's the remaining 34 books in what we call the Old Testament. See? Now Isaiah says that's where you have to go. It says to the law and to the testimony, read. If they speak not according to this word. If they speak not according to that word. You see, or, the test, or what's laid down in the law and the testimony, read. It is because there is no light. It's in because them. there's no light in it. See, now traditionally in literature and consideration, light, you see, that's like knowledge or enlightenment, illumination, understanding. See, but for us it has an even deeper meaning because the Messiah, when he walked the earth plain, you see, being the Holy Spirit, see, he said that as long as he was in the world, he was the light of the world, see. So now what is the connection between the law and the prophets, you see, and the Holy Spirit or the light? See, get me over in Peter, 2 Peter 1 and 19, please. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Now here it says that the prophecy, see, talking about the law and the prophets, it didn't come in old time by the will of man, see. In other words, people talking about men wrote the Bible. That's just not true, see. Men didn't write the Bible. That's what we're fixing to find out. Men were used as instruments, you see, to write the Bible or the scriptures in the same way that you would use a pen, you see, or a pencil. See, but the pen or the pencil is not doing the writing, see? So in like manner, those prophets were not doing the writing, and this is what Peter is letting us in on. Read. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It didn't man. come by the will of man. See, that's people's excuse. See, they'll be believing in the Bible, you see, and, and, and just really zealous about the whole thing. Then when you start going into scriptures and showing them the things that Yahweh has allowed us to understand, then their first comment is, is, well, men wrote the Bible, you see, but men didn't do it. Read. Verse 20, knowing mm -hmm. this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture Now is it says, private. no prophecy of the Scripture, read. Is of any private interpretation. Is of or is subject to private interpretation. In other words, Isaiah didn't write what he thought about it. Jeremiah didn't write what he thought about it. None of them wrote what they thought, read. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. See, it says it there. It didn't come by the will of man, read. But holy men of Elohim spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now it says, holy men of Yahweh spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. See, so contrary to some Christian teaching, you see, the Holy Spirit was all the way back there, you see, with Moses and all the prophets, you see. But the point is, is that, give me John 14, 26. John 14, 26. Mm -hmm. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the Messiah himself speaking. See, now, what I, well, this is what my point is, folks, is that you've got to go to the law and the prophets. You've got to go back to the beginning. You're not going back to a man. You're going back to what the Holy Spirit has already laid down for our consideration. Now, that's the point. I'm just backing it up, you see, so you realize that we're not just talking through our hat down here. Now, here the Messiah says that the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, read, whom the Father will send in my name. The Father's going to send the Comforter in his name. Now, the reason why he's going to do that is because he is the Comforter, see? And if you don't believe that, you read up starting about the 17th verse, you see, and you can get that kind of understanding. He said he was going to give them another Comforter, but it wasn't as if this was going to be a separate entity. It's just that their comfort would be in another form. Instead of Yahshua being their comfort from the outside, he was now going to be their comfort from the inside. See, because he said the spirit of truth, which the world could not receive, that they would see it and it would be in them. You see, and he is the truth. You see how simple that is? See? So read on. Shall teach you all things uh -huh. and bring all things to your remembrance, mm -hmm. whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay, so now we got a correlation here. See? First thing we were dealing with, no light. See? Then we dealt with the fact that Yahshua is the light. Okay? Now that the holy men of Yahweh didn't write on their own, they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
and Yahshua is the Holy Spirit, okay? So what we're looking at, him being the Holy Spirit, him being the teacher, and him being an eternal spirit. Didn't just show up on the scene, you see, through the loins of a Hebrew woman, you see, some 1,991 years ago, see? But that same spirit that was manifested in the flesh is the same spirit that's come down through the dispensations and ages. So now if the Holy Spirit is the teacher, we can't know anything about spirit, we're in a fix. See, but Yahweh had established a way in order for man to get information. See, now give me Numbers 12 and 6. Now, when I came into school and last night when I was listening to Dr. Joanne Sterling, it just, you know, that was it for me because I sort of said it like this. See, we, we grew up together and there's a lot of people here. And some of you are blessed to have your personal family in class. And I'm not so blessed. But I am blessed to have some people I grew up with, you see, went to grade school, junior high school, some people I know real well, okay, and that know me real well. See, and our testimony and our joy is just to see each other, you see, because we know, you see, where we were and what we did, and to think that Yahweh would have mercy on us to bring us in this class. You see, that's blessing enough right there, see. But now we want to find out something about how Yahweh operates. Number 12 and 6, please. And he said... Hear now my words. Now, this is what you've got. Going back to the law, you've got a man, Moses, see, that Yahweh chose. Had him born down here in the land of Egypt. You see, circumstances caused him at the age of 40 to have to flee up out of the land of Egypt and come out here in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, when he was out here in the wilderness of Sinai, Yahweh appeared to him in his burning bush, you see, and commissioned Moses to come back down here in the land of Egypt and be instrumental, you see, in the deliverance of his one son, Israel, up out of the land of Egypt, see? Now, when they get out here in the wilderness of Sinai, you have a controversy, you see, between Moses' older brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, see? Now, Aaron was going to end up being the high priest, and it said that Miriam was a prophetess. But they had a little envious situation going on here, and they claimed that they had a controversy with Moses over the Ethiopian woman that he had married, see? But as the thing came out, the real question was, was does Yahweh only speak through you, see? And now this may be a simple point. I, you know, some people I'm sure want to hear some real heavyweight stuff, see? But this is significant to me because this is the basis of what we teach. It's the basis of our faith in what Yahweh has done, you see? Now read, please. And he said, hear now my words. See, the whole issue is to hear what Yahweh has said. Read. If there be a prophet among you. If there's going to be a prophet. See, if there's going to be a prophet then, if there's going to be a prophet as far as Dr. Kinley is concerned, there's going to be a prophet among us now. If you're going to be a prophet, read. I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him. Because Yahweh is spirit, Yahweh has to make himself known. You're not going to be able to go into a laboratory, you see, and look in a microscope, read a book, go through a computer, and find Yahweh. See, in fact, it's not about us finding salvation. It's about salvation finding us. See, now that which may be known of Yahweh, now that's contrary to what somebody teach. You can know something about Yahweh. Just like you know your name, you know your social security number, you know your address, your telephone number, and your date of birth. You should, see, because knowing in that way gives you confidence. See, and it protects you against deception. Nobody can come up to you and convince you that you are not named what you've been named. You see, that you live somewhere else. You see what I'm saying? No, you don't live at 3811 West Hampton. Nobody can confuse you on that because you know it. See, read. I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him in a vision. Now, Yahweh said that he was going to make himself known in a vision. See, so when we come down to this school, and we talk about the fact that this teaching is a result of a divine vision of revelation, that should not be strange. See, what was strange was that we were ignorant of Yahweh's operation. But Yahweh said if there's going to be a prophet among you, that he would make himself known in a vision, read, and would speak unto him in a dream. And would speak unto him in a dream. And that's in everybody's Bible. See? Now that's in the law. Now give me Proverbs 29 and 18, please. Proverbs 29, 18, mm -hmm. where there is no prophetic vision. And to back that up, where there is no prophetic vision, a prophet of Yahweh being one that speaketh on his behalf or by his permission, see, got to have a prophetic vision. Just any old vision won't do. 
See, that's like someone said, well, are you hungry? Yes. Well, what do you want to eat? Well, a lot of times many of us say, oh, anything, but we don't really mean anything. You see? So just any vision is not going to do. You need a vision that's going to do the job, and the only one that's going to do the job is the one that Yahweh gives. So he said, well, there is no prophetic vision. The people perish. Well, why would the people perish? See, Hosea, the fourth chapter. Hosea, the fourth chapter, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Hear the word of Yahweh, ye children of Israel. Uh -huh. For Yahweh hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Now, I said that Yahweh had a controversy. See, and now we're some of the most controversial people on the planet. See, like it says in Acts, them that turn the world upside down are now come nigh hither. See, and we're so controversial until we don't, we have to be real careful we're not controversial on each other. You know, we get to be so argumentative and so investigative and so debative, you know, we just chewing on each other, you know. That's what Dr. Harris recommends, that a lot of you top flight ministers, just go and get your own school. <laughs> Stop eating up your dean and the board of, you know, go on out there and do your own thing. It's all right. See? <laughs> but anyway, say Yahweh has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no truth mm -hmm. nor mercy. Now, the reason why Yahweh has a controversy is because there's no truth. In other words, it's not about they're not giving enough tithes. You see, not enough people being baptized. You see, not enough churches. See? But there's no truth, Read. Nor mercy. Nor mercy. Nor knowledge of Elohim. Nor knowledge of Elohim in the land. See? Now, the only way you're going to get that is by a vision. See? So without a vision, then Yahweh has a controversy and the people are going to perish. Now, read on down to the fourth verse, I think it is, or the sixth verse. Hosea 4 and 6. Mm -hmm. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So he says, knowledge. my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Read. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. And those that have rejected knowledge. In other words, you don't want to know the truth. See, that's the only issue in our lives. That's what our salvation is predicated on, is knowing the truth, having Yahshua formed in us. See, that's where the end of the story is on the scripture lesson, where he says, behold, I show you a better way. See, talking about that love. You see, and that love is Yahshua the Messiah. Read. I will also reject thee. Now, if you reject knowledge or you reject the truth, then Yahweh has to reject you. See, because then you're contrary to him because he is the truth. See, so that's the reason why Yahweh gave us this vision. And that's the reason why we need this vision. It's the only way we can know the truth about Yahweh. And it's the only way we can keep Yahweh from rejecting us. See, and in the midst of all of the different things that people believe and, and, and conceive and imagine, see, you must know the truth. You see, as it says in Ephesians, that you be no more tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the slight cunningness of men. See? So now what about the truth? We don't want to just advertise. We want to give you some of it. You know, oh, this cake sure is good. <laughs> well, give me some of it. Okay, so now this is what we got to do. See, give me Romans 1, 19, 20. Because that which may be known of Yahweh. Now this is Saul, called to be an apostle. See? Because we're talking about knowing something about Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. See? It says, that which may be known of Yahweh, read. Is manifest in them. Is manifested in them. See? So now we got to get something straight. See? Who is Saul talking about? See? Well, once again, you got to go to the law and the prophets. Saul is writing in the first chapter of Romans about the children of Israel back here in the wilderness of Sinai. See, and if you key in on that, you'll find that to be true throughout the so-called New Testament. See, there are some people that teach that you don't need the Old Testament, that all you need is the New Testament. But if you pay attention to what's written in the New Testament, it always refers you to the Old Testament. See, because it says to the law and the prophets. And those that wrote in the New Testament were obedient to that. See, read because that which may be known of Yahweh. Now he's saying that which may be known of Yahweh. Read. Is manifested. Is now. manifested. See, now the first question on the test is who manifested it? Yahweh manifested it. See, because you can't know anything about him if he doesn't let you in on it. Read. For Yahweh has showed it unto now them. Now it says Yahweh showed it unto them. Read. 
For the invisible things of him. Now the invisible things of Yahweh, because Yahweh is spirit, spirit is inherently invisible, read. From the creation of the world. All the way back to the beginning, read. Are clearly seen. Are clearly seen. Now that right there would seem to be paradoxical. How are you going to clearly see invisible things? Well, there's more than one way to see something. See? When you say that you understand, most oftentimes, or sometimes, because I don't like generalities either, you say, well, I see. Or well, the question will be, do you see? See? And what you're doing is you're talking about something. So that seeing is understanding. So it can be understood, and that's what he said, read. Being understood. Mm -hmm. By the things that are made. So there's a particular way that we're going to understand things about Yahweh's purpose. It's going to be by the things that are made. In other words, Yahweh had this whole creation made, and he took on shape and form himself for the purpose of communicating and illuminating mankind about the truth concerning himself. See? So now we want to know something about Yahweh, or you want to know something about anybody. You take the physical things to understand the natural things. So from a physical standpoint, you can't say that you know something about someone or you know them very well, you see, you know, as they really are and as they actually exist. You know, like some of your friends, I know him. I know how he really is, see. Well, you can't say you have that kind of relationship with someone and you don't know their name, see. It's just that simple. This is my friend, <laughs> you see. I know him very well. This is my life, okay, for some folks that have that kind of relationship with a person. They say, well, who are they? Oh, it doesn't matter what you call them. <laughs> you see, that won't work from a physical, natural standpoint, folks. So if you let your emotions down, you realize it shouldn't work from a spiritual one either. See? But now how do we get the name of Yahweh? Is this something that Dr. Kinley cooked up? Or is this something that we formed a group, <laughs> you see, and went down and, and examined the thing and found it out? No. It comes the same way and the same way every time. Give me Exodus, the third chapter, please. Exodus 3 and 1, mm -hmm. Holy Name Version. Read. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, mm -hmm. his father-in-law, the mm -hmm. priest of Midian, mm -hmm. and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. All right, so now we got Moses. See, and we already told you that Moses was born down here in the land of Egypt and the circumstances caused him to end up out here in the wilderness of Sinai. Now here, he's on the backside of Mount Sinai, caring for his father-in-law's sheep, Jethro Ruel. Read. And Elohim came, excuse me, and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. Read. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Okay, so now Moses is looking at a bush, and there's an angel in that bush. Read. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now this wasn't an ordinary bush. See, this was a, I mean, to, to, to say the least, to see an angel in a bush would not make it ordinary, okay? But then to see it be burning and not being consumed, that's extraordinary, see? So what's the, what's the thing? Is this mythology? You see, is this, is this true? A lot of people want to know, did Adam really live to be 930 years old, you see? What Moses is having is a vision out here because we've already stated that's how Yahweh operates, see? He appeared to Moses in his angelic form, you see, in the midst of this burning bush. Read. And Moses said, I will now turn aside mm -hmm. and see this great sight. Now, Moses was looking at the bush. See? So then when he said, I'm going to turn aside, did that mean he was going to physically turn? No, we're dealing with something spiritual. So Moses is turning aside, you see, was directing his attention. See, now we've been over this so many times, and you're sitting back there going, okay. Uh, you know, hoping you can stay awake till I'm finished. But you got to consider this, folks, because we still see it. See, we see it in choir, we see it in Sunday school, we see it everywhere. When you get turned aside, Yahweh will go to work. See, with your problems, with the things you don't understand, you see, with what's bugging you, you see, you're right in the mix, you're dealing hard and heavy, you see. But just get turned aside. You see, look at the thing as far as the purpose of Yahweh is concerned. And then he'll show you something about it. Now, that's the way it works with me. See? So he's showing Moses something here. Read on. I will now turn aside and mm -hmm. see this great sight. See, because this is a great sight. And we ought to develop more and more appreciation for it. See, not get bored with it. You see, complacent with it. This is indeed a great sight. This is the judgment of the world. See, this is the thing that the angels inquired about. You see, and Yahweh is just freely giving it to us. 
And if we admit anything to ourselves, we'd have to admit that there's nothing that we've done or could have done to deserve the opportunity that Yahweh has given us. Read. And see this great sight, mm -hmm. why the bush does not burn. Read. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, mm -hmm. Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush mm -hmm. and said, mm -hmm. Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. All right, so now he called Moses by his name. And Moses was the only one out there. He could have said, man, hey, Joe, yo, you know, anything. Moses was out there by himself, and he's concentrating on this burning bush. He could have just started talking, see? But from a physical standpoint, you want to acknowledge somebody by their name. Read. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Read, please. Put off thy shoes mm -hmm. from off thy feet. Read. For the place whereon thou standest mm -hmm. is holy ground. Read. Moreover, he said, I am the Elohim of thy father. So now he introduces himself to Moses, because the only way you can know is if Yahweh lets you in. Now what Yahweh is doing here is he's informing Moses of a couple of things. He said that he has heard the cries of the children of Israel. He has seen their affliction. And the most important thing about that, see, I'm just dealing with some important things about Yahweh, that he's spirit, that we must know him. The only way we're going to know him is through a vision. You see what I'm saying? Now, this is the part that's showing that Yahweh's doing the work, see, because he didn't tell Moses to go down Moses. You see, like they sing it in the song and some of our Institute choir sing, go down Moses. You won't read that in anybody's Bible. See, what Yahweh said to Moses was, We'll read that part where he says he's seen their afflictions, heard their cries, etc. Exodus 3 and 7. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh said, mm -hmm. I have surely seen the afflictions. Now he said he's surely seen their afflictions. And in fact, he's responsible for it. See, because he made Abraham a promise, you see. And he told Abraham, it's not on this stuff, okay. He told Abraham <laughs> that he was going to send his uh, uh, descendants into a land that they knew not of and that they would be spitefully entreated, you see, for a period of 430 years, but that he would bring them up by a mighty hand. So Yahweh knows about this, and we need to get ready for this too, folks. Yahweh knows what's going on in our lives, you see. And, and, and for me, the whole thing of salvation boils down to us through faith being able to accept Yahweh's will in our life. That's it. There's nothing you can do about it, you see. Read. I have surely seen the affliction of my people. So Yahweh is acquainted with the afflictions of their people. He's acquainted with the problems going on down here. Read. And have heard their cries. And he's heard their cries. Read. By reason of their taskmasters. Read. For I know their sorrow. Read. And I am come down. Now this is a very important point, folks. See, Yahweh said to Moses that he was come down. Read. To deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. He himself was come down to deliver them. See? Now, he's just recruiting Moses, you see, to be a front man. You see, like those prophets being instruments. You see, Moses is just an instrument, but it's Yahweh himself that's come down to deliver his son. So now Moses needs some information in order to carry this stuff out. So over there in the 13th verse of the third chapter, he asked Yahweh, when I go back down to the land of Egypt and tell them that the Elohim of their fathers, in other words, Yahweh gave them references, See, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had come unto them. He said, they're going to want to know his name. Now, that just ought to make common sense. See, you got people around here now. You see, uh, I've run into several cases. See, and this is what's happening. See, those of us who know each other are going around hugging and kissing each other. And then some of us, you see, we have spouses or we have friends that don't know all the people that we know. So we're going around just hugging and kissing and so on and so on, and they're just standing there. See, and then we go over here and hug and kiss some more, and then they're just standing there. See? Now, they want to know, well, who was that? You see what I'm saying? And furthermore, they want to know why you aren't introducing them. Okay? <laughs> see, so that's the way it was going to be down here. Moses couldn't come down here and just do all these things, you see, and say, well, who is that? You see what I'm saying? So Moses had to introduce them to the Heavenly Father, and he had to have a name. See, now, I just try to explain that, you see, in just simple terms. See, now let's go back to Romans 1, 19, 20. And for the time that I have remaining, I want to deal with something. And it's not really any different, but it was something that, that really struck me. There, there's an individual, <laughs> and he was in class, and he left class, and he went to the synagogue. I've known people to leave class and go a lot of places, but I've never known to leave class and go to the synagogue. So... He has this book, 
okay? And he's buying copies and he's giving them to class members because our fourth aim says that we study comparative religion. So people will hold you hostage to your value, you see? So he's giving his book out, and the book is called The Myth Maker, and it's by a Jew known as uh, Hayim Makovic. And his assertion is this, that Saul was not a Jew, he was not a Pharisee if he wasn't a Jew, right? That the things that are written in the New Testament have absolutely no validity. That the gospel, so-called, did not begin to be written until after Saul had assumed his apostleship. And that the things that are written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are more influenced by Saul than they are by the Messiah. That they are fictitious. That the controversy between the Pharisees and the Messiah is not true that indeed he was Pharisee, and the Pharisees voted in favor of the converts on more occasions than not. And then it just goes on and on and on, okay? Now what this says then is this, see? That the whole New Testament is not valid, okay? Now, this is the first occasion where I ran to anybody that could try to make an effort to uh, discount the things that we teach as much as we discount the things that everybody else teaches. And I considered it to be an almost reasonable challenge, okay? So then I thought about it. You know, what if we could not use the New Testament at all? You see? Would the things that we teach still be valid? See? And it caused me to realize, you see, the great mercy that Yahweh has bestowed upon us. You see? And even to the extent, not trying to be sacrilegious, but Saul said it himself, that there always be true in every man a liar. You see, so if you want to call Saul a liar, that doesn't discount what we teach, you see. And this is the reason why. Read Romans 1, 19, 20 again. Because that which may be known of Yahweh. Because that which may be known of Yahweh. Is manifest in them. It is manifested. You see, in other words, Yahweh himself has manifested. We are protected. We are blessed. Read. For Yahweh has showed it unto And you. Yahweh himself has shown it. Read. For the invisible things of him. Read. Uh huh. Are clearly seen. Uh huh. Being understood by the things that are made. By the things that are made. Now read me Hebrews 9 and 2 in the King James Version. And read me Acts 7 and 44. Hebrews 9 and 2. Now I'm, I'm looking at the New Testament, folks, but we don't want to believe that. See what I'm saying? In other words, we want to test it, see whether or not it's true. See? But I realized the position that this man was in being a Jew. Because Saul wrote, deep is the mystery of holiness, that, as we read in the third chapter of Exodus, Yahweh was manifested in the flesh. Now, do you understand what kind of position that puts them in? See, as far as them rejecting the Messiah and not accepting the testimony of the apostles, if Saul is correct, you see, they're hung. You see what I'm saying? See, much on the order of the, where it's written that the Messiah asked them about John's baptism. Well, they couldn't accept it because they didn't accept it. But they couldn't deny it because of the people. See, so that, you know, in that kind of situation, the best thing you can do is come out fighting. See? But anyway, read Hebrews 9 and 2. For there was a tabernacle made. Now, it said that there was a tabernacle made. See, and Saul said that the, we're going to understand something about Yahweh by the things that are made. See? But we don't believe this. You see what I'm saying? In other words, we're, gonna, we're not going to be Christian about Saul. Okay, now read Acts 7 and 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Now, see, we don't believe that, but he's talking about the old part of the book, which they do accept, that there was a tabernacle in the wilderness. It was a tabernacle of witness that the ones who are still true had. See, now where do we find this tabernacle? And it's something that's made, you see. And that's how we're going to understand something about Yahweh. Well, let's go back to Exodus 24, chapter. Exodus 24, 1. Mm-hmm. 24 and uh, 9. 9. And 10. Mm -hmm. Exodus 24, 9. Uh-huh. Then went up Moses and Aaron. Now, we're back with Moses again. Now, you got Moses and Aaron. See, read. Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu, and it's right here on this chart. Read. And 70 of the elders of Israel. And 70 elders. In other words, got some witnesses. That's what we have in this school is we have some witnesses. We have some evidence. We have some proof. We have something for you to taste. You see, you don't just like, it's like you look at the scratch and sniff in the magazine. See? 
you look at the pictures and you look at the pictures, but then you scratch it and you can smell the flavor or the odor, you see. Now you've got some incentive. See, well, that's what we've got in this school. We've got evidence. We've got witnesses. We've got things for you to consider and to investigate. See, now it said, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders went up into Mount Sinai, read. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. And it says that they saw the Elohim of Israel. See? Now, this is Yahweh in this incorporeal shape and form of a man. See? Now, this is the shape and form that Yahweh took on to communicate with the prophets and the patriarchs because we cannot conceive of him in his pure spirit state. This is the love that he had for mankind, see, to make himself known. Now, they saw Elohim, read. And there was under his feet. And Elohim had feet, read. As it were, a work of a sapphire stone. And, and his feet were on the paved work of a sapphire stone. Read quickly, please. And as it were, the body of heaven in his queen. And he had a body, read. Mm -hmm. He didn't lay his hands, see? So now this is what Moses saw. So now when Moses was called on up into the summit of the mount, and there and there and the bayou and the 70 elders were told to tarry here, and the children of Israel were gathered around the base of the mount. See, now when Yahweh called him on up into this cloud, you see, what he did was he showed Moses this tabernacle pattern, see? Now, this tabernacle pattern is nothing more than something that was going to be made in order to help us understand something about Yahweh, who is spirit and who is invisible, and everybody's not going to have this vision. See? Now, what is the evidence that Moses saw this in the mount? See? Read Exodus 25 and 8. And let them make me a sanctuary. Now, look, this is not Moses talking to the children of Israel. See? This is Moses' account of what Yahweh Elohim said to him while he was in the cloud. He said, let them. See, now them becomes a key word. Because Saul said that that which may be known to Yahweh is manifested in them. See? So now here he says, let them make me a sanctuary. Read. That I may dwell among them. And the reason for the sanctuary is that Yahweh himself may dwell amongst his children. See, we don't worship a God that's off amongst the sun, moon, and the sky that we hope to see someday. We're going to have to see him now. You see what I'm saying? See, we must inherit eternal life now. See, and then our hope is to be immortally glorified, but that's not a hope like a wish. That's just a I'm waiting on it to happen kind of hope, you see. So this is what you've got. Read. According to all that I show thee. See, now there's the evidence that Yahweh showed it to Moses. Moses didn't make it up, see. He said, you let them make the tabernacle according to all that I've shown thee in the mount where Moses was. See, read. After the pattern of the tabernacle. Now this thing was made after something, see. It was made after the pattern, read. Uh -huh. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof, uh -huh. so shall you make it. All right, so Moses saw the pattern when he was up in Mount Sinai. But now this pattern is something that's made to understand something that is invisible. And the something that is invisible that it was made to understand is Yahweh Elohim himself. See, this is a physical manifestation or a schematic breakdown of Yahweh such that we might know something about it. You see, now read the 40th verse, please. And look that thou make them after their pattern. Read. Which was showed thee in the mount. Okay, so now these things had to be made explicitly after what Yahweh showed Moses. There could be no deviation, no interpretation. See, it couldn't be subject to any private interpretation because it's shown to Moses by the Holy Spirit. See, now give me Psalms uh, of 70, 72 and 7, 16 and 17. Psalm uh, 72, 17. Uh-huh. His name shall endure forever. No, that's not what I want. Uh, it, about the sanctuary where David said he went to, <laughs> until he went into the sanctuary. <coughs> 73 and 16? Okay. Psalm 73, 16. Mm-hmm. Come when on, we're running out of time now. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Now, you might ought to go back and read that. See, it might help you out with this convention. See, David wanted to know some things that he wasn't so pleased with. He wanted to know why this was. See, and this was the answer, read. Until I went into the sanctuary. Now it says, until he went into the sanctuary, read. Of El. Uh-huh. Then understood I there. Then he understood it. So this sanctuary is something for us to understand. See? Now when we look at it, see, it's a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. One, two, three sections, but it's just one tabernacle. You see what I'm saying? See? Now, what we're looking at here, get uh, 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 the 17th chapter of John, or get uh, first, John, the first chapter. John 1, 1 and 1. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the Word. Now, it says in the beginning was the Word. Now, Christianity said that the Word is your Bible. 
See, but we know and understand that the word is Yahweh Elohim himself. See, when you read over in uh, Psalms, it says, in the, uh, uh, by the word of Yahweh were the heavens made. You see, Psalm 33 and 6, you can read that. See, now it says, in the beginning was the word, or Yahweh Elohim, read. And the word was with Yahweh. Now it says that the word was with Yahweh, read. And the word was Yahweh. And it says that the word was Yahweh, read. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. And the same was in the beginning with Yahweh. Now read on down to the 14th verse. And the word was made flesh. And the word was made flesh, read. And dwelt among us. And dwelt among us. Now that's really in the New Testament. See, and people reject that. They reject the fact that the scriptures have been fulfilled and that the Savior has been manifested. See, but when we look at this tabernacle, we'll find out that this most holy place, holy place and court roundabout, corresponds to Yahweh in his pure spirit state. Yahweh Elohim being that intermediate state between pure spirit and the flesh, you see, and then Yahshua the Messiah being likened to that court roundabout. See, not three separate individuals, but just three states of existence of the same spirit. See what I'm saying? Now, you got some evidence to support that. And this evidence comes out of the old part of the book. Now, give me Genesis 1 and 26. But my point is, is that with this pattern and what the founder said, that this is the judgment of the world, then we don't have to depend on any man. See, whether he wrote in the New Testament or the Old Testament. You see, I've heard it said that someone asked a question about lost books of the Bible. See, the apocrypha, that, that that is separated by most of Protestantism. And that the way you could determine whether or not they were authentic or valid or somebody bring you a book, say this was left out of the Bible but for some rhyme or reason. You just lay it on the pattern because the things that are written in the Bible do follow the pattern. See, read. And Elohim said, mm -hmm. let us make man. So now in the old part of the book, Moses wrote that Elohim said, let us make man. Read. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. In our image and after our likeness. Well, what would that be? See, would he be made like a cube or like a glass or like a shoebox? You see what I'm saying? But the same Moses that wrote that, he also wrote a description of Yahweh Elohim. See, so when he said, let, make, let us make man in our likeness and our image, then we have something to see whether or not the man was made in his likeness and image. See, because the man has a head cavity, chest cavity, and abdominal cavity. Then he has his appendages, which are arms and legs. You see what I'm Arms and legs. You see what I'm saying? See, and they fit the description that Moses gave of Yahweh Elohim. So then we can understand that man is made in the likeness and image of Yahweh. But we got something to confirm it with. See, because we got a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout, one, two, three sections, but just one tabernacle. See, and the man is a head cavity, a chest cavity, an abdominal cavity, but he's just one man. See, and all of that is pointing to the fact that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three but yet one. You see what I'm saying? See, and it extends even further than that. You got the tabernacle, you got the man, you got everything in the creation. You say, well, I don't, I don't understand that. I want to ask a question. See, you raise your finger, and it's threefold, but it's just one finger. See, your eyes principally, and our pupil and iris and the retina, but it's just one eye. See, and both eyes see the same thing. And the phenomenon about the eye is, is that the eye only does one thing. It perceives light and nothing else, see? So if there is no light, then the only way for you to see something in your head is by your imagination, see? So consequently, if the Holy Spirit doesn't teach us and he is the light, then everything else can be nothing but imagination. You see what I'm saying? See, because the only thing you can see with your eyes is the light. But nevertheless, see, your ear and inner ear, a middle ear and an outer ear, but it's just one ear. You see what I'm saying? So even when you look at this tabernacle in relationship to the state of Yahweh, you can see that it still fit. Now Yahweh fashioned himself, and it's written in Leviticus that he fashioned himself, or he said he would dwell in a cloud. Well, when you looked in this most holy place, see, you had the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat thereon, and the two archangels. You see, and Yahweh dwelt in the cloud. See, so then the most holy place would be likened to the cloud. See, when this cloud abode on Mount Sinai, you see, Moses was the only one that could go up there. Of course, he went up there with Joshua, but we understand that Joshua was the one that transfigured. See, so if you go along with me on that, Moses was the only one that could go up there. And then when you read in the 33rd chapter of Exodus where it says that anybody that sought Yahweh went out to the tent that was pitched on the backside of the mountain. See, but the only one you ever read that ever went out there, <laughs> you see what I'm saying, except when Yahweh called Moses, uh, Aaron and Miriam out there, was Moses. You see? So the only person that could go up in this most holy place, you see, was that high priest. You see what I'm saying? See, so that's like it under Yahweh. You see, inaccessible. The high priest could only go in there once a year when this cloud was sitting on this ark. 
see it and look and to signify the fact that the cloud was sitting on the ark. See, because wouldn't anybody know that? That was invisible under them. Isn't that right? See, y'all, we had to put a physical manifestation of a cloud above the tabernacle. See, so by this cloud, they knew that that cloud was still on the mercy seat. So when this cloud went up, that was their signal, you see, because they didn't see this cloud. You see what I'm saying? So then when you get to Yahweh Elohim being likened unto the holy place, you'll find out that the priesthood and the low priest, you see, they operated in this holy place. So now that's likened unto these 70 elders and Aaron, Nate, having to buy you, you see, being a witness to Yahweh Elohim. Because Yahweh Elohim is the intermediate state between Yahweh and his pure spirit state and Yahshua in the concrete. So then you only had a few people, you see, that proceeded this vision. You see in the prophets and the patriarchs, like Ezekiel, you see in his vision, he describes the same thing that Moses, Aaron, Nate, Abner, Abihu you saw. You see what I'm saying? And then Nebuchadnezzar saw the same thing, walking in the fiery furnace. You see, but that's like unto the holy place. Then when you come to the court roundabout, this gate was 30 feet wide. And this is where everybody had to come. See, everybody in Israel had to come up here. See, and the reason why they had to come up there was because they sinned. And everybody in Israel sinned. You see what I'm saying? So this was accessible, you see, to the common man. You see, this is where the thing was accomplished, you see, as far as his salvation. You see, on the atonement. You see, when they had to strike the blood on the four horns of this altar and that sacrifice had to be washed in his labor, seeing this high priest who was anointed, you see, would then take that blood, you see, and pick up some incense and then go up here to Yahweh and make the atonement, you see, or accomplish the salvation, you see, uh, uh, for them. See, so now that's like under Yahshua and the Messiah manifested in the earth plane. You see what I'm saying? See, read me Matthew 11 and 27, 11 and 29. Eleven twenty-seven, mm -hmm. and turning to his disciples, he mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. "All things are delivered unto me of my Father." Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back that far because the time is gone. Twenty-nine. Says, okay, what we want to deal with is where he says, "Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden." Twenty-eight. Said, okay. Come I'll just unto quote. me, <laughs> all ye that labor mm -hmm. and are heavy laden, mm -hmm. and I will give you rest. And I will give you rest. Read. Take my yoke upon uh -huh, you uh -huh, and learn of me. Uh -huh. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, mm -hmm. and ye shall find rest unto your soul. Okay. All right. So this is where we have to come. We have to come to the court roundabout, or we have to come to Yahshua. You see? Now, when you go back and read Exodus, the 15th chapter, and you find out that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt, they sang a song. It said that Yahweh was their strength and that he was to become their Savior. You see what I'm saying? Then you read over in Isaiah 43 and 11, where Yahweh says, Besides him, there is no Savior. You see what I'm saying? Then when you read in Matthew, see, and you read back in Isaiah, it says that the virgin's going to have a child, and he's called his name Emmanuel. See, well, when you have the names and titles straight, you see, you realize that Emmanuel means El with us. You see, and with the understanding that we have according to this tabernacle pattern, realizing the unity of the Spirit, then we'd have to know that Yahshua is El with us. You see what I'm saying? See, but now the point is, is that he's named Yahshua. It says, for he shall save the people from their sins. Well, then the question is, who's going to save the people? You see, back here, Yahweh said, I am come down to deliver them. You see, and then the, the, the thing being accomplished in this tabernacle, looking at the unity of the spirit, you see, we find out that Yahweh is the one that's going to have to accomplish the deliverance. Now, don't use that, you see what I'm saying, for something else. See, because we realize that the way that Yahweh accomplished that is through Yahshua the Messiah. See, so don't try to hang me up into Yahweh the Savior. You see, no, Yahshua is the Savior. But we understand that we're dealing with the unity of the spirit. You got to come in the front door. You see what I'm saying? See, and that's Yahshua. So, okay, this is the point, folks. See, that, uh, that this salvation, you see, was already laid down in the Old Testament. See? So then when we get to the New Testament and we start looking at a man talking and claiming to be something, see, then we've got something to look at, whether that man be in the New Testament or whether the man be down here now. See, because the atonement was accomplished by the blood, the water, the spirit. You see what I'm saying? See, so when Yahshua comes in going according to the same pattern that the children of Israel went according to, going according to the same pattern, you see, that Noah went according to, going to the same pattern that the creation came in by, going according to the same thing that went on with Jonah. You see, then that gives him a lot more credibility than some man who went to Hebrew University and has got a problem, you see, with another religion. See, every time you go out there and plant your garden, you see, you're looking at a death, a burial, and a resurrection, which goes according to this Yahweh-given pattern, you see. And this is the judgment of the world. This is the truth. This is the thing that will let Yahweh be true in every man alive. See, when everybody in here is born, you see, there's going to be a show of blood. 
there's going to be some water. You're going to have to take in that breath of life, which signifies the spirit and the normal gestation of a human fetus in the mother's womb is 40 weeks. See, this is infallible. You see, it's too high a fence to jump. You see, it's too broad a border for anybody to go around. And we need to realize that this is the most important thing beside Yahshua in us. See, that's the most important thing. See, it's Yahshua in us. You see, that's our only hope. See, this knowledge and all these things that we study, see, that's to keep us still long enough, you see, for Yahweh to reveal and manifest himself in us. See, a lot of this is, is a carnal-minded man could follow it. You got enough iterations and examples of anything, you see, the kids sing songs from listening to them time and time again. See, but the true reality, you see, is going to come. You see, through faith in Yahweh. See, I want one more scripture. Read me Hebrews 11 and 6, and I'll be done. Hebrews 11 and 6. Mm -hmm. But without faith, mm -hmm. it is impossible to Now, I said without him. faith, it's impossible to please Yahweh. See, because when the children of Israel came up through the wilderness of Sinai and they got here to Canaan's land, the reason why they could not cross over is because they didn't have any faith in Yahweh. See, out of all the things that they did and all the things that they were, you see, and how they acted and all these things, you see, that's a whole nother story. See, because when the thing comes down to the end, like it was in the 18th chapter of Luke with the young rich man, do you have faith in Yahweh through his son, Yahshua the Messiah? See, can, can you take up your cross and follow him? See? So it says without faith, that's what all these things are, to bring us up to a point to where we can have some faith in Yahweh. See, because without faith, read. It is impossible to please it's him. It's impossible to please Yahweh. You can correlate until you and I are blue in the face. But if you don't have no faith in Yahweh, if you don't believe in Yahweh, if you cannot accept Yahweh's will in your life, see, you don't have nothing. You don't please him, see, and he's not keeping that that doesn't please him. Read. For he that cometh to Yahweh. And if you're going to come to Yahweh, read. Must believe that he you is. You must believe that he is. And that's what this teaching is, is to give us a belief that Yahweh is. That's first. Evidence and proof that Yahweh exists, he's still in business, and how he operates. Read. And that he is a rewarder. Now he is the rewarder. Just like he was the deliverer, just like he is the creator. See? He is the rewarder of what? Of them, that diligently of them that diligently seek him. Not their own glory, not somebody else's glory, but diligently seek Yahweh through his son, Yahshua Messiah. Now, I thank you for your time and attention, and I don't know, but I hope that you got some out of my testimony. With us from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mr. Rhett Jackson and Mr. Peter to Mona, I believe it is. Let's acknowledge him, please. Now, Dr. Opal Lewis needs to see immediately following this morning's session Tamika Johnson of the Lesswork, Louisiana class, David Jinks of the Rochester, New York class, and Tanisha Benford of the Bakersfield, California class. Please meet Dr. Opal Lewis in the rear of class immediately following our morning session. Our next speaker for this afternoon will be the Dean of the State of Michigan and of the Detroit, Michigan branch, Dr. Donald Embry. Thank you ever so much, and good morning to you all. I'm happy to be here uh, and to see all of you that I do know and to all of you that I don't know. And I'm surprised 
I thought I'd figured it out. Uh, but, you know, you never know. You can sometimes be wrong. I said, well, I know they're not going to call on me. Uh, it's because uh, there's been a many schools set up since uh, I come into the school. I was uh, led to come in. And I said, well, uh, a lot of these new ministers, you see, uh, uh, let them roam. And I've enjoyed them all myself. And I want to say this, too. Uh, I don't have any complaints. And if I did, I wouldn't say nothing about it. It's because we're not here to uh, stir up adversity, uh, any of those things. And this school wasn't set up to teach invent strife and hate and malice and all of those kind of things. I thought it was hard to speak before 400 people that this is a problem. <laughs> it's really a problem. But nevertheless, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be in this school. I'm talking about the IDMR. I'm, I'm happy to be a member of the school. It's because I have learned to be obedient. And I've learned patience. And just about everything I'm going to say to you, I've learned in this school. So now, if I say something that offends you, or you don't like, then what you do, you put it on the school. It's because that's where I learned it. Now, one thing I've been thinking about since I've been here, and I was thinking if... Uh, <laughs> I did be called on, I was going to say something about it. And that is the, a few things that I've heard uh, which wasn't proven under me. And that is that the founder begged. Now, I don't know where I heard that at, and I won't say I won't try to uh, deal with that, but See, he never begged anybody for anything. What he did, he asked you for whatever he wanted. Is that right? And if you didn't give it to him, what he did, uh, what he did, he took it. You see? And I don't particularly, uh, it somewhat makes me ashamed when we have to beg. It's because the Christian world, that's what they do. See, they, they just beg the people and I, I was listening to Dr. Gill there and all the rest of the speakers. I can just about repeat something each one of them said. Now, I didn't get it all, but I got something. And he said, you see, that uh, Christian Doom, you turn on the TV and they be telling you, say, well, uh, 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 call us now. See, uh, send your plagues in. Now, what I want to say, and then I'll go on and say some of the things that I've learned in this school is that See, we don't have to beg anybody for anything. No, we don't have to do that. And I'm not criticizing or chastising. Or that's not my duty. Uh, but I want to say something to uh, maybe stir up your pure mind. Now, Yahweh don't have to beg the world for anything that he's already got. He don't have to do that. And you can look at it from this standpoint. Now, what I'm getting at is, see, you cannot run any organization, are you listening, without any money. You just cannot do it. But when we go and preach in such a way that it makes people think that uh, uh, this is free. Sure, the gospel is free. You can't pay for that. And if you did, you wouldn't get your money at work. You see? You cannot pay for this vision. But now, it takes money to run an organization. You can't go out, you can't come in a place like this without no money. <laughs> no. These folks don't want no $2 tip. And I believe I made mention of that before. You see, there's no use to come into Dallas without no money. But now, here's what my point is, see. This, this is what my point is. See, now, uh, 
I believe they've been announced and there have been some 4,000 people here. Uh, maybe a few visitors and what have you. Now, I'm not here to uh, speak to no visitors. I'll leave that up to uh, the elders or some of the rest of them. What I do is like to, I like to teach the pros. Is because, see, somewhere down the line, we've missed the boat. In so much that uh, uh, every meeting you got to uh, ask somebody to uh, help care on this organization. Now, I, I don't know whether you're going to get mad with me or not, but uh, I brought my stuff. <laughs> but I won't say that. See, uh, uh, see if you got 4,000 people, <laughs> 4,000 folks, a dollar apiece, wouldn't that be $4,000? Or more. Which would mean, you see, uh, it don't make no difference whether you are big or small. Now, I was told, you see, it don't make no difference how many people is in the school. But I find that's becoming a problem. It's because we're not being able to carry out what we've set out to do is because of this money problem. And that's one thing I want to uh, say something about. Do you mind? If you do, I'm going to do it anyway, so it don't make no difference, you see. Now, since I made the statement, there are a few things I've heard, then I want to uh, read something. Would somebody uh, get for me uh, uh, where Paul said, now I'm about blank as I can be, I can't remember no scriptures unless I have to, is where he says that, some have not the knowledge of Yahweh. I want that first. And then I want to go to uh, John 14, 20. Now, it don't take me long, so you don't have to worry about me standing up here for no hour and all that kind of stuff, because I didn't come down here to impress anybody. I come to be impressed. And I come to observe and to check out, not scrutinize or criticize, but see, uh, I come here to learn something. It's because if this is a school and not a church, then a school is a place where you come to learn something that you already know. No. Uh, we come here to learn something that we didn't know. You think I'd spend $50 to understand, uh, uh, understand an hour to come down here to find out something I already know? I want to know something I don't know. Now, that's what I want. Because what I already know, I know that. But if I don't know something, then uh, I'm willing to pay for that. How about you? All right. Uh, would you read? Romans 10, 1. Romans 10 and 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Elo to Elohim for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, uh, see, when I come into school, I wasn't looking for this. Uh, I wasn't a Christian, neither am I one now. And I didn't figure that there was nothing as far as God was concerned that I could receive. It's because I felt that uh, I was somewhat out of place in those circles. But when I met the founder and also the other brethren that uh, I met in the school before I met him, See, when I met him, he told me he already knew me. And I tried to shake the man's hand and say, I know him. They said, get away from me. You understand? And I was somewhat embarrassed it's because I said, now, I know he don't know me. But then come to find out he did know me in every way. Now, my prayer, and we don't know how to do that as we ought to, is that what? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to Elohim for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, is yeah, that they might be saved. Now, I do get the impression that many people think that they're already saved. And in some cases, it is boasted about. And in such a way that I see that it causes some of the troubles that we're having. Read. You don't mind, do you? All right, read. For I bear them records that they have a zeal. Now, just about everybody, whether they're in here or wherever they are, they, they have a zeal. Uh, don't you have a zeal? And yeah, sure you do. 
And when I say something, you answer me. Read. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of Elohim, but not according to knowledge. Now, but are not according to knowledge. Now, I want to go over there where I told you I, I didn't uh, say where it was. Said now, and I'll be back there. Said some have not the knowledge of Elohim or Yahshua, and I speak that to their shame. That's what I want, then I'll be back there. Anybody know where that is? You wouldn't mind helping me, would you? Let me see. Because I'm, what I'm trying to do is to get you some help. <laughs> All right, read. <laughs> Some have not the knowledge of uh, uh, Elohim or Yahshua, and I speak that to their shame. Now, I know somebody know where that is. I, I can't remember. All right. Thank you ever so much. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Mm -hmm. Awake to righteousness. Now, some have a zeal, but the zeal that they have is not according to knowledge. You see? And the reason for that is because we hear many things, and the many things that we hear, some of them are not true. Okay? Read. Awake to righteousness and now, sin not. Now, awake to righteousness and sin not. And it is a sin and a shame to have to beg for some money. Read on. For some have not the knowledge of Elohim. Now, then, since if some have not the knowledge of Elohim, then here's where I got into a debate. An individual told me that everybody has got the Holy Spirit. And I said, no, I disagree. And I have been persecuted for that. Now, if some have not the knowledge of Elohim or Yahshua or Yahweh, then how can you have the Holy Spirit without the knowledge? Would you answer me that? Now, some have not the knowledge. Then I would say some don't have the Holy Spirit. What you say? Read. I speak this to your shame. Now, the apostle says, I speak this to your shame. <laughs> and by the way, I noticed that these cameramen, they were standing up, but not sitting down. <laughs> you see, okay, read. <laughs> I speak this to your shame. I speak this to your shame. But yeah. some will say, how are the dead raised up? Now, some will say, how do you raise the dead up? Since we've been talking about a death, burial, and resurrection, uh, how do you raise the dead up? Uh, by telling them lies, you see? Or do you raise them up by telling them the truth? Now, my point there is, you see, uh, talk is cheap. Now, the founder, he could really talk. He could talk all night and all day. But I wasn't impressed by that. What I was impressed by is he could do something to prove something. He could back his talk up. Now, if uh, we have the truth, then we shouldn't talk. We're going to have to show something. Is that right? All right. Read. And with what body do they come? Uh-huh. Thou fool, mm -hmm. thou which thou, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Now, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Now, would you go to 14, John 14, 20. And then we'll get on to 26. Now, if some have not the knowledge of Yahweh or Elohim or Yahshua, and it's a shame, then now the Holy Spirit, which we've learned in this school, is the teacher. Is that right? Or he's supposed to be the teacher. Now, if he's not the teacher, you're not going to get anything. And certainly, if he's not the teacher, I wouldn't be as happy as I am today. I've been happy ever since I've been here. And some of the folks, I said, what's the matter with you? I'm happy. You see? You get the point? Well, I uh, said, well, a lot of people are depressed. Something matter with them. Something wrong with them. See, this is no place to come to be depressed. And you spending 70 and 60 and $100 a day, <laughs> yeah, that's no place to be depressed. <laughs> see, you've just been depressed before you got here, you see me. So uh, 
you might as well go ahead and enjoy yourself. You see, and then go on back home and, and try to work and pay your bills. <laughs> you see, the point. Because see, if you're going to big shot, you got the big shot. All right, read. That's okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to get in trouble. I was hoping they didn't call, call on me. So see, what I do, I tell it like it is. Now, they tell it just like it is, and that's what I was taught, is to tell it like it is and let the chips fall where they may. Already no folks ain't going to like you. You see? It's because some folks say, well, uh, uh, we're supposed to preach like this. I preach like I learned it. That's all I know how. You see? And as I told you, I'm not a religious man. See, when I come into school, I didn't know nothing about no Bible. Would you believe it if I told you? I need to know nothing about Moses. <laughs> and that's a shame. That's right. And the men used to take me and get, uh, I remember, I remember, and this been years ago, uh, uh, take napkins and, and draw three-fold pictures for me and try to show me and back and forth to the Bible. And I appreciate it. I really do. And uh, it has paid off, you see. It's because uh, Yahshua the Messiah is the champ, you see. Uh, you can't knock him out. And how I caught on to that was the founder, he used to talk about how he boxed, you see, and how that the Muslim, they come and uh, took his, uh, asked him and beat him up and all that kind of stuff. And he said, I could have ripped him open, you see. He said, I used to be a professional boxer. I like that, you see. And I'm not a violent person, but I like that. It's because, see, what he showed me, uh, uh, he wasn't like Jesus, all sweet and and slap him on one side, and he turn the other cheek. I ain't that kind of a fellow. No, baby. Mm-mm. You see? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And that's the reason I said, well, I don't belong in this school, you see, because if you slap me, I'm not turning nothing but you. <laughs> All right, read. <laughs> you see? So, so don't come up putting your hands on me. I'm telling you that now. I don't care if you pro or con, don't touch me. Because I'm not going to do nothing but what you tell me. Read. At that day, you shall know. Now, at that day, that is when you see and understand. At that day, you're going to know what? That I am in my Father, and you in me. Now, the man that we met, see, the day I really seen him, I, I'm talking about the day I really seen him, and uh, I could tell you many things, but I know I don't have time to do that, but the day I really seen him, I'm saying, uh, he scared me. I'm talking about the day I really seen him. And see, uh, see, he do all kinds of stuff. And then laugh, <laughs> laugh about it. You know, and said, well, uh, you want to see something? Watch this. And see, we're sitting up there in the apartment and, and hear the, this place go to shaking. And the earth said, well, uh, how about that? <laughs> and see. Well, I knew, you see, I'm talking about that as far as them trying to tell me something about the Bible, you see, I already told you I wasn't looking for God. See, I wasn't going to see nothing like that. But see, uh, evidently, uh, he must have wanted me because he showed me what I wanted to see. And that is, if you the champ, I won't see something. And folks, whew, I've seen so many things, you see me, until if somebody put me out of this school, I'd park on the steps. <laughs> I wouldn't leave. You just have to, have to go ahead and do something to me. I'm going to come around, hang around. I'll look in the windows first. <laughs> you see? In other words, here's what I'm saying. I'm not going anywhere. I don't care what the devil or you or anybody else say. I'm not going anywhere. And I'm going to be obedient to what I'm told. Now, I learned that in this school, how to do what I'm told. You see? It's because if you can't follow nobody, you never will lead no one. I bet you. You see? All right, read. John 14, 20. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, mm -hmm. and you in me. Now, when I seen the man, I found that out. Read. And I in you. Uh-huh. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, he gave us commandments, didn't he? Didn't he tell us things to do? And we're supposed to carry that out. Is that right? And what I'm after is, is, is the Great Commission, as they call it. It says, go out in the world and, 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 and preach the gospel to every creature. And we're trying to do that. We've been turned down, but we've tried to preach to everybody we've met. And the many folks, understand, have been very nasty about our meeting. But we tried to preach that that he told us to do. All right, read. 
Matthew 28, 18. Uh-huh. No, no, I don't want that. I, I still want 14, uh, 21, and go on down to 26. Now, I'll do the directing. Read. John 14, 21. Uh-huh. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, uh -huh. he it is that loveth me. Now, he it is that loveth me. Now, if he told us something to do, we're going to have to carry that out if we love him. Now, if he don't, he's going to get it. Read. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And he that loveth me. And somebody said, well, you know, uh, uh, and I was accused of this in 1969 uh, by my parents and relatives. I don't have nobody in the school but my family or the rest of my relatives, you see, talking about they'd rather that I stay away from them. And they accused me, said, uh, 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 Don, are you worshiping a man? No more than you worshiping your preacher. Read. You see? And see, I didn't too much like that because, see, here they're worshiping the preacher and I done met somebody that, that's greater than I, even my own natural father. And somebody, you understand, that uh, I could really relate to. You understand? And here they said, well, you wish been a man. You see? <laughs> but they couldn't do nothing about it. <laughs> really? They, never, they ain't been able to do nothing yet about wishing. And somebody said, well, you wish been a man. What are you going to do about it? Read. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, uh -huh. and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And I will love him, and that's what I'm getting my point to, and I will manifest myself unto him that loved me, unto him that loved me, you see? And that's my testimony, you see? Uh, see, I don't worry about no smooth talk fooling me. See, I can see you. It's because we have learned what we were supposed to learn, so uh, don't let no smooth talk fool you. I don't care what you come up with. I see what you're doing. Read. 22. Uh-huh. Judas saith unto him. No, would you go on to 2014, 20, 20, 26, so I can get on with what I have to say and sit down. Because I know you got many people want to speak, and I want to hear them, you see. So I ain't come down here and do no whole lot of speaking. I got plenty of places to speak. Read. But the comforter. But now, since some have not the knowledge of Elohim or Yahshua, and since uh, I was told, and, and this is uh, important people telling me that, that uh, everybody's got the Holy Spirit. Now, what their proof was, it says, I believe that's uh, uh, John. You see, the first chapter said that he lighted every man that come into the world. Well, I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed. As far as everybody having the Holy Spirit. It's because, see, the Holy Spirit, if it's in somebody, wouldn't you say it had to be manifest? Answer me. Then if, if you see something manifested that the Holy Spirit didn't do, what are you going to say? That ain't it. Read. You but see? The, but the comforter. But the comforter. Which is the Holy Ghost. Now then listen, see. If the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is the teacher, then shouldn't it make you comfortable? Or should it depress you? It's supposed to make you comforter since he's the comforter. And that's what Joshua said, said now, uh, the com but the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, said now the Father's going to send that in my name. Well, what's your name? Jesus Christ? No, Joshua. The Holy Spirit is coming in his name. Is that right? Now, what's your name? Read. <laughs> right. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Whom the Father will send in my name. Whom the Father will send in my name. Now, here's what I told him. I said, now, if, if everybody's got the Holy Spirit, here's what I want to know. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, which the Father shall send in my name. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. Read. He shall teach you. He shall teach you. All things. Something. <laughs> See the difference? He shall teach you what? All, All things. That's how you know the, it's the Holy Spirit. That's how we know the old man had the Holy Spirit. Why? He could teach you anything in all things. Now these folks impressing me, said, well, I, I've got the Holy Spirit. Well, teach me all things. Don't teach me something. I can do that. But the Holy Spirit is supposed to teach all things. That's the reason I don't appreciate nobody telling me, well, you teach this. I teach what I please. 
And what I please is what I know. I can't teach what you tell me. I can't even act like you want me to act. You see, but I'll match anything you do. Read. And bring all things to your remembrance. And then listen, I'll bring all things to your remembrance. Now, if he never told you nothing, what do you remember? You see. Now, would you go on uh, uh, back? Uh, 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 Wherever it was in the first place. Romans All right. 10. Romans 10. I believe it was 1 Corinthians, wasn't it? Scripture reading for today? Yes, yes, yes. First Corinthians. I hope I'm not wasting your time. All right. But see, I won't get some points over. It's because without it, you're going to have to think about some other things, too. See? And uh, I'm going to say this, too, before you read. Would you give me a break? Is this. See? Uh, See, uh, you can't have no head without no body either. See, if your feet hurt, I bet they give you a head a ache. You got to take care of your body. And it's the head job to do that. You see? Now, I already know, it's just like Dr. Aaron Bryan says, see, when you say things, then somebody, I go out of here, you see him talking about, there's somebody's mouth poked out, and I might have to pull my pistol. And said, well, now he's jumping on the internet. No, I ain't talking about nothing like that. You see, I do it. I did everything they told me. You see? Uh, didn't I? Everything I've been ordered to do, I did it. That they have ordered to do. So I'm not talking about that. But what I'm trying to make a point, you see, talk is cheap, but you got to do something to prove something. You got to back up what you say. A bunch of talk ain't going to do nothing. That ain't going to save nobody. You follow me? But you have to manifest that that you say. Is that right? Now, I know you're telling people that you got the truth. You see him talking about, and then he'll he, he go around here begging. Don't make no sense to me. Now, if I get in trouble, I can stand chest high. And I learned that too. But go ahead and read. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. In other words, you see me. See, the founder wasn't cheap. He wasn't cheap. And you can't run this organization cheap. See, if, if we the champ, let's show him. You see him talking about. That's the point about that. See, it don't take no whole lot, but see, you're going to have to uh, uh, say, well, uh, here's what we want going to do. Say, well, we've got, got some big schools. They ought to give more money than the small ones. I don't agree with that. <laughs> Everybody quiet now. <laughs> well, how come they're small? Somebody got to be lazy. Get up and move it. You see? If you want something, go out here and get it. The world is full of it. You know, that, uh, we, we bought this computer and they ain't got nobody to operate it. Well, I'll go find them. I'll go find them. Find somebody to run it, you see. You follow? It don't make no sense, understand, to be out here for 20 years, understand, they ain't got no four or five people. Read. <laughs> it don't make no sense to me. But see, he said, well, it don't make no how many people you got in the school, you see. Yes, it do. Yes, it do. Because if it, this place is supposed to be operated by free will donations, you see me got to have somebody to donate. You know, a dollar every class, you see, dollar, 400 people in the class, a dollar every class ought to get you through. Wouldn't you say? But see, the idea is, you see him talking about, I see, uh, we talk big, but we act cheap. And I don't believe in living like that. Read. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Mm -hmm. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. Now, see, concerning spiritual gifts, I think everybody in here would consider that Yahweh is giving them a gift, wouldn't you? Answer me. See? In other words, you know something, don't you? See? And don't you feel that there's something within you that you can contribute to understand to this vision and revelation? Now, he, he, that is concerning spiritual gifts. We know you got natural gifts. We just have to uh, work with that. Read. I would not have you ignorant. Now, we don't want you to be ignorant concerning uh, these gifts, because some people, they misuse their gifts. Read. You know that you were Gentiles, mm -hmm. carried away unto these dumb idols. Now, wasn't we wishing idols before we came in here? 
and see. Uh, and also, we were worshiping one another. And from what I hear being said and manifested, uh, that is continuing. Is that right? See, as I already told you, I've been accused of that. Uh, uh, and, and not only worshiping a man, I've been accused of folk worshiping me. Ain't that a shame? Now, what do you see here to worship? You see? But I don't believe in talk. I believe in doing something to prove something. You see what I'm talking about? You follow? See, if you say, well, well uh, uh, we need $1,000 from each school. Ain't no problem. I'll match it. Say, well, but uh, uh, some school can give 500 No, uh -uh, I don't go for that. Nope. Mm -mm. And I'm telling you to your face. I don't go for that. I'll do anything anybody else do, but don't expect no more out of me. Read. And <laughs> folks, I ain't mad. Please believe me. I, I'm, 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 if you're talking about somebody in this, I'm in this. But I just want you to know you see what I'm talking about. See, uh, 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 some things, see, see that, uh, like the speaker was talking uh, last night, see them half-truths, I don't go for that. No half-truths. Okay. Say, so, well, we didn't come down here for you to teach us. I'm not teaching. I'm talking. Read. You know that you were Gentiles carried away. Now, we know we were Gentiles and see, worshiping everything. See, didn't we give money to the churches? Answer me. Give so much, that's the reason we don't have any. Isn't that right? Now we come in here, you see him talking about, say, well, the gospel is free. Sure it is, understand, but this place is not. Sure the gospel is free. Ain't nobody charging you for the gospel. But these schools you got around here, you go try to tell a landlord, understand, say, listen, uh, what we're going to pay you is the gospel. They ain't going to go for that. So when you go and, and preach in such a way about the flesh, I know folks don't like me, and see, that's the reason I don't like to speak. See, I'd rather sit down and listen, see. Yeah, because, see, the, the, the whole lot of talk, you're going to have to do something, or else the devil's going to run you lost, you see, because he don't want to hear nothing but money. And all you got to do, understand, get in his face and say, here, shut your mouth, read. Easy. And listen, it's easy, too. You see, that's the reason I, I told the folks at the last convention that I was at, see, if you want to see how to get hold of some money, See me. And they got mad with me, and some folks haven't spoken to me since. I wasn't lying. You see? And listen, we don't have to do nothing crooked either. We ain't no crook. Read on. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, mm -hmm. even as you were led. That's right. Wherefore, I give you to understand. Now, I give you to understand. Now, these cameramen, you try giving them $2 for their services. They don't want that. You can hire them for $2. Promise them a certain amount of money, they want that. Is that correct? Now, if Yahweh promised us eternal life, what you want? What he promised. All right, read. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of Yahweh. Now, no man, if he say he's speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, or by the Spirit of Yahweh, do what? Call it Yahshua a curse. See, call it Yahshua a curse, or call him a liar. See? And if you do, he's going to get you. Read. And that no man can say that Yahshua is the Messiah, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, no man can say that the founder was the Messiah, but by the Holy Ghost. See, if that's not in you, you won't recognize him. You wouldn't have recognized that's what it was. You see? Except that the Holy Spirit be in you. But my point is, that's not in everybody. Because if it was, they could see it in somebody else. But they see it in some folks. And they preach some things. <laughs> you know? Now there are diversities of gifts. Now there are diversities of gifts. Now what I'm getting at, I'm saying, is, is this body. See? Get the point? See? Now, uh, I think you need everything on your body, don't you? <laughs> and some of the things on there you don't like. But you need it. Read. But the same spirit. See? Now there are what? Repeat again. Now there are diversities of gifts. Now there are diversities of gifts, you see me? Now we shouldn't get mad because someone don't have this or that. You see me? They're the verses of gift, you see. Already know I'm not no preacher, but I can tell the truth. Read. 
Now there are diversities of gifts. Now there the are diversities of gifts. Read. But the same spirit. But listen, see, it's the same spirit. Read on. And there are differences of administration. Now there are differences of administration. You see what I'm talking about? We can't all operate the same way. We don't have the means. Read. But the same Yahweh. But it's the same Yahweh. I never seen the founder put nobody out of the school. You see? Did you? Said, uh, 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 and some folks said, well, we don't want them kind of people in here. What kind of people are you? We don't want certain folks. That means you ain't got no money. Read. And there are diversities of operations. Now, there are diversities. You see, not adversity, but diversities of operations. Everybody can't operate the same way. You see? But it's the same thing. Read on. But it is the same Yahweh. But it's the same Yahweh. If you sit down and take a good look. Read on. But, it's a, but it is the same Yahweh. It's the same Yahweh. Which worketh all in all. See? Why? Because he's all in all. You see? Now, when he resurrected from the grave, you see him talking about, see, he ain't going to take none of that slapping. Mm-mm. You see? Now, when he come in to fulfill, see, when he come in to fulfill the law and the prophets, see, he didn't, they, 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 they crucified him, didn't they? Put a crown of thorns on his head, see? Nail him in his hands and in his feet because of what they did back here and he's fulfilling. But now when he rose from the dead, you say, listen, listen, it's my turn. My turn now. You start nothing. You see? And that's why we want to know him after his resurrection. Not after you see him talking about what he did before. See, he doesn't fulfill that. But now you see him talking about, see, he's tough. He's rough now. You take no stuff off the devil. Would you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you take nothing like that, you see. You the point? But the manifestation of the Spirit. But now the manifestation of the Spirit. Now, that's, that's, see, uh, we know, and I, I know the Bible. I know what's in that. See the, see the flesh. Sure, the flesh is out. We're not after the flesh. Is that right? And he said, said the, said the flesh profited nothing. Is that correct? You see him talking about it. But I want to ask you a question. Are you in a physical body? Or are you immortal? Some folks say they're immortal, walk around understanding the physical body. You understand? You see? Eating hamburgers and all that kind of stuff like they're immortal. You see? You got a physical body on, you see? You can't leave that out, and it's hurting you. It's aching you. You see? And you get old. Something started happening to you, and ain't that right? You see? But say the flesh is out. Sure it's out, as long as you robust and all together. Read. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given. But now the manifestation of the Spirit is. Is given to every man. Now it's given to every man. You can't pay for that. I already said that. See? It is given to every man to do what? To profit with all. To profit with all. Now if you got the Holy Spirit, where's your profit? You got to profit by it. Is that correct? Don't just have no Spirit and it don't do you no good. Ain't that right? See, we didn't have before, understand? You see, I mean, you thought you were doing good, didn't you? But now, you see, we received the Holy Spirit, some folk, you see, and it's supposed to profit us, you see, because listen, see, without it, understand, the devil going to beat you up. You heard me. Without the Holy Spirit, you ain't no match for the devil. He'll tear you up, you see what I'm talking about. See, make a fool out of you, you see. And then listen, see, if you already know some have not the Spirit, or some don't have the Holy Spirit, you see him talking about, then you ought to know understand that they ain't going to do what you want them to do. Ain't that right? Read. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. See, to one, see, by the Spirit, see, he got wisdom. That's the reason you see him talking about we need everybody. The feet, the toes, toenails, and everything, you see. We need all of that, see. To make it one body. Read on. To another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. See, to another, the word of knowledge. Now, uh, wouldn't we say that, that that is these attributes here? See, to another, the word of knowledge. That's by the same spirit. Read. 
to another faith by the same spirit. See, somebody said, well, listen, I got faith. That, that's by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. Now, to another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. But if you go out here and say, claim you heal somebody, I'm saying, I bet you get in trouble. So you can't heal nobody. Anybody ought to know that. If they understand the truth, you can't do nothing. Now, the Messiah said, without me, without uh, 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 the Father, I can't do nothing. Then how are you going to do something that he couldn't do? You see? So if you know somebody healed somebody, you know that's not of them. Because if it was, you could do it. Isn't that right? Read. To another, the working of miracles. Now, to another, they work some miracles. You see? Like uh, get some money when they need it. Read. To another, prophecy. Now, to another, prophecy. They can tell you what's going to happen or what's going to come to pass. Is that right? Read. To another, discerning of spirits. See, now, to another, see, I'm talking about, see, uh, uh, see, you go to them and say, well, listen, see, he said, uh, is, is this a bunch of devils over here? Let me see. See, he can discern them spirits. Read. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. See, to another, you see, I'm talking about, diverse tongues. Continue. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Then, see, if somebody's speaking in tongues, wouldn't you have to have an interpreter? You see? If somebody come in here speaking Spanish, wouldn't you have to uh, have an interpreter? I know I would. Read. But all, about all I know is, uh, come on, star is stage. That's more bad. That's, that's about all I know. You see? So if somebody say something else, I'd have to have an interpreter. Read on. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit. Now then, but that's all worketh that one and self same spirit. See, if we come together, you follow? If we come together, we can do what we're supposed to do. But if we stay divided, see, that ain't going to work. You see, get the point? And as I understand it, it takes the natural to understand the spiritual. See, I don't particularly care for nobody telling me. He said, well, you know, Don, I love you spiritually, but I don't particularly care about you in the flesh. <laughs> I, uh, I don't go for that. That's that smooth talk. That's that smooth talk. Because you're going to take one thing to understand another. You ain't going to ever get together in the spirit if you can't get together in the flesh. And then listen, if you do, see me later and I'll take it back. Read. Because you take the natural to understand the spiritual. You see, talking about? see, talking about the teaching in the mind, and out of the mouth, and then hating one another and can't get along, mm-mm, it ain't going to work. Verse 11. Would you agree? No, you can't do that, you see. Not if you're going to tell me to take the natural understanding of the spirit. You can't hate me in the natural and tell me you love me in the spirit. You know what I'm going to tell you? Get out my face. <laughs> and I don't go for that, you see. You the point? See, because that's foolishness. See, you take this to understand this. That's the way we teach that. You see? You can't show me no natural, no uh, spiritual knowledge, and I don't see nothing natural happening with you. I don't want, listen, folks, I just don't operate that way. Now, if I'm wrong, you see, I'm talking about I'll quit. I don't operate that way. You see? See, if I'm going to kiss you, kiss me back. Now, if you don't want to kiss me, I won't kiss you. You see? But you take the natural understanding the spiritual. You follow? Me? Not just saying, well, you know, if we're in the I know we're in the spirit. You see? And I also know this. Some folks say, well, you know, the law is out. I know about that. You see? But you still got a physical body on. Or else these restaurants understand when you're going to make no money. Three. So now listen, no, you see, you're just not going to kid me with no foolishness. No. See? Now, if you can't get along in the natural, you see me, there's that no happening in the spirit. And see, if you're going about it, you're going about it the wrong way. Three, you know? But all these work at that one and the self-same spirit. But this work at that one and self-same spirit, see? Now all we have to find out is, like the founder said, see? And like he told me, and you probably heard it too, said, listen, ain't nothing to you. Now if he said it wasn't nothing to him, you think something to you? And he could do all kinds of things, you see? In the first place, let me say this too. See, you don't have no man over here to worship. You ever thought about that? You don't have no man to worship. You see? Now, you might have somebody to take you, you see, or swindle you, but you don't have no man over here to worship, you see, unless you deceive. Continue. 
But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Mm -hmm. For as the body is one. Now, as the body, how many bodies you got on? How many? One body. That's all I got is one body, you see. So my this is theory. Read. For as the body is one. Now, as the body is one. And hath many members. And listen, see. It's got that many members, plenty of branches, is that correct, on the body. As the body is one and has many members, you see, your body got many members. And they have to be taken care of and considered. Is that right? You see what I'm talking about? See, these members on your body have to be considered. Or else you see what I'm talking about, they're going to cause you trouble. Read. And all the members of that one body being And all the members of that one body being many be many are one body. Are one body. So also is Yahshua. Now so also is Yahshua. Thank you, my dear. See, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. I hope I said something to help someone rather than offend them. And may Yahweh be with you all. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, class. Let's go to Isaiah eight and twenty. Isaiah 8 and 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, I was born and raised in Judaism. And as Michael Taylor was speaking on the floor, he was talking about a fellow that left class and went on over to a synagogue. And I kind of marveled at that sitting in my seat. And I thought to myself, my goodness. And a lot of thoughts went through my head. And this scripture came to my mind in Isaiah 8 and 20. And it's always a very appropriate scripture because to the law, that's the first five books of the Bible, and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Now, when I was in Judaism, I didn't know anything really about the law, folks, and I knew less about the prophecy. And what Judaism has done is deteriorated down to a point dealing with the Talmud. And I just want to cite a couple of examples for you about Judaism, and then I have something special on my mind that I have been thinking about for many weeks, uh, and we'll get into that, hopefully, Yahshua permitting. Now, one thing that's taught in Judaism is when this great name of Yahweh was given, the Jews became fearful of this great name of Yahweh. And they did not, res they just wanted to really hide that name. And over in the Talmud in Sanhedrin 10a, there's a verse by Abu Sal. Okay, now I just want to tell you I learned more about Judaism in, my, in this class than I did going to temple. And I see David sitting in the front row there, so I know he'll help me out and verify this. And if I misquote this, David, you let me know. Now, Abu Saul was a great rabbi. And this rabbi said, if you pronounce the name Yahweh according to its letters, you lose your place in the world to come. Is that what he said, David? Right. David said, that's right. <laughs> now, in other words, here they are over in Judaism. Yahweh gave that great name to them, that great name of Yahweh. And you can see and check out the scriptures that it was called a great name. Now that name of Yahweh was given, and it said it was to be declared, and he raised up Pharaoh so that his name would be declared. And you'll read over there when they went into Canaan's land that David said he was going to declare the name unto the brethren. And they come right along, and they misquote and misrepresent verses and say that they have tried to 
hide the name Yahweh, and it was not to be told to anyone. And I think about this fellow going over to the synagogue. He just went right into the fire, really, because there's just no way that you can really come to any knowledge and understanding there. That came to my thought. Now, also, when Yahweh gave the law from Mount Sinai, let's go over to Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, and uh, start reading, if you would be so kind, please, uh, Carolyn, over there in the 16th verse, Deuteronomy 4 and 16. Now, before I came to this class, I knew nothing about the fact that there was a divine pattern mentioned in your scriptures. Okay. And uh, they mentioned that men were here from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they are very diligent, but they also know nothing about the tabernacle. So you've heard of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, but that's not what we're discussing. We are discussing the divine tabernacle that was given from Mount Sinai and that the different prophets and different ones down through the scriptures knew about. Now, this tabernacle pattern had three parts to it, as Michael was explaining to you. So your, head, your body must have a head cavity, a chest cavity, and an abdominal cavity. Had a cloud here, so you have a brain here. Grain white here, you gotta, your brain is gray and white. Ten Commandment Law, pituitary gland in your brain. Master Law, master gland. Blue, purple, and scarlet veil. Arterial blood is red. Venal blood is blue. Loaded. You got the thyroid gland. That's blue, purple, and scarlet. The, the purple with the thyroid gland. Altar Vincent, got your lungs. Four main ingredients. Four main ingredients in your lungs. Seven branch lamp stack. Seven branch, uh, branch aortic arch. The light flickers or pulsates. Your blood flickers or pulsates. Table of shoe bread here. You got the, your heart for substance here. Twelve loaves of bread here. Twelve pints of blood here. Labor of water here. Kidneys here for cleansing. The labor's for cleansing. The kidneys are for cleansing. Got an altar of sin sacrifice here. Got your intestines here. The sacrifices were placed here. That's where periodically you, you dump the ashes here. Two layers of linen around this. Two layers of skin around the body, the dermis and the epidermis. Now look, folks, this is in everybody's Bible, and it's right in Exodus. Now here I was in Judaism, folks. They never told me about that pattern. And you can't tell me if somebody doesn't know something, then they're proud and people tend to have that pride and vanity that they would not come along, especially somebody from the Jewish persuasion that thinks they're the chosen people and not show you this divine pattern. And I know that I've never been to a temple. David, you ever been to a temple that's explained the pattern to you? No. And there are others sitting in here, you follow. And I can, well, let's go on to this here. Now, here's another thing that happened to me that I was astounded about in Judaism. Let's read this 4 and 16. Please start, Carolyn. Uh, 15. Deuteronomy 4, 15. Yes, babe. Take you, therefore, good heed unto yourselves. Now, take good heed was the instructions here that Moses was given before they crossed into Canaan's land. Read. For you saw no manner of similitude on the day that Yahweh spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. Now, the... They never recognized that great spiritual anthropomorphic being there on top of Mount Sinai. They never saw or recognized that. Read. Lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground. Now they were told, don't make anything in its likeness, don't make any images, don't make anything that would even appear or try to be like a god. Read, right, go right down to 19 if you would. The likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, should it be driven to worship them and serve them, which Yahweh the Elohim has divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Now they were told not to worship the sun, the moon, or the stars, or anything. Is that what we just read, Carolyn? Yes. Now, here's a funny thing, and I had always heard this all my life, and maybe some of you can attest to heard this. Maybe you know somebody that's Jewish, or you work for somebody that's Jewish. They'd always use the expression, mazel tov. Anybody ever heard that expression? Do you know that that expression means have a good constellation? Have a good constellation. You heard me. You know what a constellation is. It's stars. So they're saying to each other, make sure that your stars are okay. Do you understand what that represents or what that means? That means that they were worshiping the stars. So now we're finding out we didn't know the pattern. 
We didn't know the name. We got them worshiping stars and constellations, right? So there is a great number of errors in Judaism, okay? Now here's another thing that I was, I was lied to about this one. See, this just was a flat out lie. And we have it just painted here, and I really can't get to the 40 foot chart. But I was told the story that Abraham smashed all the idols, and there was never any idols in Judaism. That's what I was told, that Judaism never had any idols, never was involved in idolatry. That's what I was told, okay? And that's what I was made to believe. And I distinctly remember as, uh, the, the whole story about how Abraham, then he fr flew, uh, went out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and so on and so forth, and Judaism was rid of all of its idols, okay? Now, that's what I want to discuss with you here is idols. And that's going to be what we're going to work with for the next few minutes. Now, as we've come into class and learned about this great vision, we've learned that this pattern, which we've showed your physical body by, and we can go into all kinds of science over here, whether it be the atom or the cell, the atom being threefold, proton, neutron, electron, or cell, DNA, RNA, ribosome, or nucleolus, nucleus, and the cell body, that's threefold because of the threefold pattern that exists. Now we can take and pay attention now because we're going to get to moving here. I won't be as fast as Joanne Sterling, but we're going to get moving here. Now, we're going to come right over here, and you see this pattern here. You take the self-same pattern, and you can lay it on each story in the Bible. Had an altar here, had to offer up the sacrifice in Egypt. Had a labor here, had to come to the Red Sea here. Had a cup of holy anointing oil here, had the cloud lead them here. Had it rain down manna here, had a table of shoe bread here. Had a phenomenal light in the wilderness here, had the lamb stand here. Had Moses working as an intercessor going up the mountain, had the altar of incense here. Had the Jordan River as a veil here, so we have the veil here. Had the temple here, had the Ark of the Covenant here. So we can take the same pattern and lay it on different stories in your Bible. Got a 40 principle in here, so they got to be in the wilderness here for 40. Now we can go just right over in the other direction too and pick up Yahshua the Messiah. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not worried about explaining the story without the New Testament, folks. And then we'll go, that's where we're going and you'll see why. Now watch. We come right on over. Because really, folks, the New Testament is not, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I'll never forget listening to a tape of Dr. Kinley, and people love to argue whether the New Testament was written in Greek or not. They love to argue with you about that when you start explaining this teaching. They're trying to shoot a hole in it. So they say, well, the New Testament was written in Greek. And you've got to stand there and say, no, it wasn't written in Greek. You follow? If the New Testament's being written in your heart and mind, right? That's where the real New Testament's supposed to be. It better not be in Greek. <laughs> right or wrong? You'd have a heck of a problem if that was a story. See, you want to make sure it's plain, it's clear, and you're using the law and the prophecy to get that testament across. Now watch. You come right on over and slide the pattern over here. Had an altar here, the Messiah, he's got to be the sacrifice. Got a labor here, he's got to go to John to be baptized. Got the cup of holy anointing oil here, you've got to have the spirit present. Got a 40 principle in here, He's got to be in the wilderness of Judea for 40 days. Got a table of shoe bread? He's got to be that bread of life. Got the lampstand here? He says, I'm the light of the world. He talks about he is the only intercessor between Yahweh and man. So we got principles of blood, water, spirit. So we can see him with the blood. You got water, you got spirit. And we just take the same pattern where we don't see it in one spot, we just pick it up in another. We just take the pattern as a slide rule and move it from one story to the other, and we can pick up these principles of this divine operation. Right or wrong? And we've learned that in this teaching. And that's what makes this teaching special. Now watch. Open your Bible. We've got to turn the lights up? We'll turn the lights up. Open your Bible, the 31st chapter of Genesis. Everybody, please. This is beautiful. Now, Carolyn, you want to start reading? Genesis 31.1. And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying... Now watch. Everyone in here, at one time or another is familiar of the story of Moses and Pharaoh, right or wrong? Almost every one of us in here have heard that, right? Now, what we're going to do is just remember that's going by our divine pattern, right? And we've got our divine pattern and that story's operating on it. Now watch. We're just going to take this story. Remember those idols. Don't hold on to that. Don't let go. And we're going to take the story of Jacob and Laban. And watch how our divine pattern 
is just repeating itself, right? Go ahead and read, babe. And he heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's. Now look, they're talking about the fact that Jacob, the man Jacob, is going to take from Laban, right? Well, didn't Moses end up taking from Pharaoh? You just follow along. This is very simple. Go ahead and read, Carolyn. And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's has he, has he gotten all this glory. Now, Donnie Emery talks about coming to learn something. Now, watch. I'm begging you, open your Bible, folks. This is going to be worth you opening up. There's something in here that I know I've sat in class a while, and somebody said, read the 31st chapter of Genesis. And I took the time to read it, and I could see how this divine pattern and how these principles of these stories are repeating. So, hey... You've come to learn. Let's get down to business. Go. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Now look, Laban's countenance towards Jacob changed, right? Is that what you just read? Right. Didn't Pharaoh's countenance towards Moses change? Look at folks. Pharaoh just wasn't accepting Moses, right? And didn't we read that there's a, a Pharaoh that rose up that knew not Joseph? So we got the fact that Pharaoh's countenance or his feeling towards these Israelites changed. So Laban's countenance must change towards Jacob, right? Go ahead and read. And Yahweh said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. So now look, how do you spell countenance, Carolyn? C-O-U-N-T-E-N-A-N-C-E. A-N-C-E? A-N-C-E. Thank you. So he's going to return, right? Wasn't Moses going to return them out into the wilderness? So Jacob's got to return them. Read. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock. Go ahead. And said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not toward me as before. So now look, didn't Pharaoh change towards the Israelites and towards Moses? Yes, he did, folks. So you've got to see him change between Jacob and Laban. Read. But the El of my father has been with me, and you know that with all my power I have served your father. Now look, weren't they in servitude down here? Weren't the Israelites in servitude in Egypt? So look, here's Jacob. He's serving Laban, right? You got serving? You got serving. Go ahead and read. And your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. Uh-oh. Laban was deceiving Joseph, or Jacob, right? Well, look at folks. What was Pharaoh in the business of? He was a deceiver, wasn't he? Now look, he changed his wages ten times, right? Watch what happened back. So that shows you, I'm sorry, cameraman, but that changes here. Laban changed his mind ten times, right or wrong? Right. Now look, here's Pharaoh. Plague one. You guys can go. Go ahead and leave. So get right or wrong? He says, no, you got to come back. Plague two. Oh, you guys can go. They're ready to leave, right or wrong? Right. No, you got to guys got to come back. You can't, you can't go. Plague three. You guys can go. Right or wrong? Right. What happens? How many times did Pharaoh change his mind? How many times did Laban change his mind? Read. But Elohim suffered him not to hurt me. Now, did Moses get hurt? No. Did Jacob get hurt? No. Go ahead. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring streak shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring streak. Now, here's the principle. Did the children of Israel multiply down there in Egypt? Was there great multiplication there? So what's got to happen with Jacob? You've got to have, you know what this symbol stands for, don't you? Great multiplication. Great multiplication with Moses, you've got great multiplication with Jacob. Right or wrong? Read. Thus El hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. Okay, now, I think swing on down to about the 16th verse, if you'd be so kind. For all the riches which Elohim has taken from our father, that is ours, and our children, now then whatsoever Elohim has said unto thee, do. Then so Jacob now look, 
Wasn't Moses doing what Elohim said? So now you've got to pick up that Jacob is going to do whatever Elohim said. Read. Then Jacob rose up and set his son... Wait a minute. Think about this, folks. Did the children of Israel rise up here? So what has Jacob got to do? Got to rise up, right or wrong? Rise up. Rise up. Read. Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels, and he carried away all his cattle and all his goods which he had gotten. Now watch. Didn't they make a migration here out of Egypt? What do you think is going on here, folks? Isn't Jacob about to make a migration? Deception ten times, things multiplied, Pharaoh disturbed him, he was uh, serving Pharaoh, or serving Laban, his, Laban's countenance changed. Can't you see how this story parallels the migration? You ought to be able to see that. Read. And he carried away all his cattle and all his goods which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting, which Read. he had gotten in Pandan Ram. Go ahead. He to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. Go ahead. And Laban went to shear his sheep. And Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. Now watch, folks. Pay attention now. Hold on. Hold on. You read here that Rachel, she's Jacob's bride, has got what? Images. Idols. You want to be smart? Teraphim in Hebrew. You follow? They've got images back here, right or wrong? And the bride is bringing out images. The bride of Jacob is bringing out images on this migration. Well, look, folks, when they come out of the land of Egypt, they're coming out of the land of Egypt. What are they bringing with them? Please go to uh, Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, and I think the 8th verse, and hold Genesis. Keep one finger in Genesis. Go to Ezekiel 20, I think 6, 7, and 8. They're coming out of this land of Egypt, folks. Now watch what they brought with them. Read. Ezekiel 20 and 6. Yes. In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them. Go ahead. Oh, so he's going to bring them out of the land of Egypt, and he's going to bring them to a special land. Go ahead and read. Flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Read. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. Now look, folks, when these children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sinai, what did they bring with them? They brought with them idols from Egypt. Right or wrong? When they're in the wilderness, they're in the holy place. They're up here at this mountain. They had idols with them from Egypt. Well, look, folks, here's Jacob on a migration. Isn't he carrying idols from Egypt with him? You paying attention to this or are you sleeping? Listen, folks, this is, this is taking your divine pattern and applying it and getting the principles. That's what you've come here to learn. You ought to be wide awake. Okay, uh, keep reading if you would, please. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, but they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. So you got rebellion here, right? Go ahead. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So, so they brought idols with them in here into the wilderness of Sinai. You hold that train of thought. We'll be back to that. You hold on to that in your head. They brought idols into this land of Egypt, right? Now, let's go back to Genesis. Go ahead and read, Carol, there in Genesis. Genesis 31, 19. And uh -huh. Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images uh -huh. that were her father's. Right. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, in that he told him not that he fled. Now look, so Jacob fled from Laban, right or wrong? Didn't Moses flee from Pharaoh? Go ahead. So he fled with all that he had. And Didn't he they leave out. out of here with all that they had? Leave out of Egypt with all that they had? So he's got to leave out from Laban with all that he had. Read. And passed over the river and set his... Uh-oh. What's Jacob got to do? He's got to pass over a river, right or wrong? Yes. Why? Because didn't they pass over the sea right here? Yes, indeed. Read. And set his face toward the mountain. Uh-oh. Well, they come across the sea. Where did they set their face towards? The mountain. The mountain. What's Jacob got to do? What's he got to do? He's got to set their face towards that mountain. Right or wrong? Now watch. Read. And it was told Laban on the third day. Uh-oh. So on the third day, you got a problem, right? Pharaoh's coming after him. 
So look what happens here. On the third day, Laban starts chasing right after him. You catching this or no? Right by your pattern. Read. The Jacob was fled. Read. And he took his brethren with him and pursued after him. Didn't Pharaoh pursue after them? Yes, indeed. So what's Jacob got to do? He's got to, or what's Laban's got to pursue after Jacob? You catching this now? Go ahead. And pursued after him seven days' journey, uh -huh. and they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. Uh-oh, now watch. Haven't we talked to you, and, and you've been admonished, how that Pharaoh died at that sea, but that spirit came on up, and that's why they built that golden calf at that mountain? Because of that unrighteous spirit that was present? Can't you see that that spirit of Pharaoh went right to that mountain? Look, folks, can't you see that that spirit of Laban goes right to that mountain and chases right after Jacob? You catching this now? So now look, here's the cardinal point. Here's the key point. They brought images with them. See, I was told that J I, uh, Abraham got all, rid of all the graven images. Remember that when we started? And that Judaism never had any idols? Well, you can see right there, they had them. They had images and they had idols. Now, you got that, right? Now, here's what I want you to do. We know back here, and I'm just quoting now for the sake of time, that this is our schoolmaster, right or wrong? And we go back here for our, our lessons, our types, our shadows, our analogies, and we look back at these children of Israel, that's our schoolmaster, right or wrong? Every one of us have been taught that. And we go back here to learn what was set up. This is in our Mars management and everything else back here with these children of Israel, right? Now watch. So we're going back here to check it out. Now let's go over and find out a little something about idols. Now, let's go over, uh, Carolyn, if you would please, go to Colossians 3 and 5. And uh, the girl next to you, I don't know, I'm sorry, could she go to Ephesians 5 and 5? Colossians 3, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Right. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil conspicuance, uh -huh. and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now what we got to do when we're working with something is we got to get a definition. We got to know what we're talking about so that make sure it's clear in your heart and in your mind. May I just ask you, what's your name, young lady? Linda. Linda? Okay, super. Now, here's what we got to do. We're finding out that covetousness, when you covet something, that's equal to idolatry, right or wrong? When you're coveting something, what, now what is covetousness? That you would say is a, I'll use the word strong, desire, right? So if you're strongly desiring something, it can be an idol. Oh yeah, it can. You think about your own personal self, folks. These examples back here are for you to apply inwardly, folks. Now leave on the canvas. Now, Linda, would you be kind enough to read uh, Ephesians 5 and 5? For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, have any inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah of Yahweh. Did you read about covetousness there? It says idolatry? So you got covetousness is idolatry. That's two places that Paul wrote that. Now here's the point. Anytime Paul writes something in the law and in the prophecy, he never said a word that's not back in the Old Testament. Anything he says, I don't care what it is, if you know the book well enough, it's back there. Because why? The same spirit that was in Paul is the same spirit that wrote the law and the prophecy. So if you're going back to that, you're going to get your witnesses. Now let's go over to 1 Samuel 15 and 23. First Samuel 15, 23. Yep. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now when you're stubborn, stubbornness can be as idolatry. Okay? Now what we want to do is go back in the law and go back into prophecy and check out these witnesses and see something about idolatry and check it out. Become aware of it. Become conscious of it. Look, folks, 
if that's what their problem was back here. Didn't he give them commandments? Don't make any images. Don't have any idols. Did he give them those commandments? Did they go out and make idols and make commandments? Do we go back here for a schoolmaster? Do we go back here to learn from? What do you think could be our problem? Don't be naive. Don't be a liar. You could be involved in idolatry and not even recognize it. Except that your conscience has kind of got you tripped into oblivion and you're thinking, what's the matter with me? You follow? And every, one, every person has done something like that at one time or another. Now watch. This idolatry. So you can be stubbornness is as idolatry, right? Now watch. Let's go over to the 7th chapter of the book of Joshua. And I've got to run now. So we're going to the 7th chapter of the book of Joshua. Okay? If you'd be kind enough, Carolyn. Now this is, we're in, we went in the law, and you know about the idols written in the law, right or wrong? Look at folks, you know one of the commandments is don't make any graven images, don't make any idols, right or wrong? So that's in the law. Now we're going into the prophecy, and we're going to check out the books of the prophets, and we're going to look and see what's in there about idolatry. Now, this is the story of Achan. Go ahead and read, Carolyn. Joshua 7, 1. Yep. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Now, they did an accursed thing, and they committed a trespass. Linda, you go to Deuteronomy 27 and 15, 15 or 16. And watch how this ties together, folks. You watch how this ties together. Let her read first, to Carolyn. This is Deuteronomy 27 and 15. Read. Deuteronomy 27, verse 15. Yes. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image. Now, one of the things back here in the law, that you would be cursed if you made a graven image or made a molten image or made some kind of image. That was a cursed thing back here under the law. Anything else there, Linda? An abomination unto Yahweh. And it will be an abomination unto Yahweh. Go ahead and read, Linda. The work of the hands of the craftsmen and put it, it in a secret place. Now, if you make an image or an idol. You pay attention to this now. You pay strict attention and open your Bible. Look at folks, why you be here. As Emory already said, you're paying 70 bucks a night plus, right? Plus you gotta eat. You ought to be paying attention while you can. Getting as much out of it as you can. Trying not to fall asleep, right? Now look, so look, it's a cursed thing and it's an abomination if there's an image or something that's hidden or something that's tucked away in a secret place. Right or wrong? Is that what you just read? Is that right, Linda? Right. Now, you got it there in the law. Now we're going over into Joshua in the seventh chapter, and we'll deal with Achan. Remember, remember this reference in Deuteronomy. Remember it. Remember how it, what it stated. Jot it down. Go ahead and read the eleventh verse, Carolyn. Eleventh verse. Yes. Seven eleven. Joshua seven eleven. Yep. Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant. Now look, at Israel sinned, and they've transgressed the covenant. Read. Which I commanded them. Which he commanded them. Read. For they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Now watch. What did Linda read? Linda read to you that if you make an image, you make an idol, you hide it in a secret place, it's a cursed thing. Is that what she read? Is that what's written in Deuteronomy? Now we're over in Joshua. We're checking. We're confirming what's written back in the law. Now, you just read, Carolyn, in Joshua 7, 11, that they've done a cursed thing. They've stolen something, and they've hidden it away. I think you've got to go down to about the, I don't know if he's the 20th verse or the 16th verse of that chapter and pick up the rest of the story. As Aaron Bryant would say, you need the rest of the story. Come on. 20. And Achan answered Yahshua. Uh, pick up the whole list where the tribes come together. I don't know what verse that is. 16th verse. 16. So Joshua rose up early in the morning. Now Joshua was up early in the morning, folks. Read. And brought Israel by their tribes. Now he's getting all the tribes together, folks. This is a general assembly. Read. You know what a general assembly is, don't you? So Joshua's called the general assembly here. Read. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And now he takes the tribe of Judah, one of these 12 tribes that were around this tabernacle. Read. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zebdi was taken. 
Read. And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Sarah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, and make confession unto him. Now look what's happened, folks. Get the picture. He's called all the tribes. Now he's zeroed in on the tribe of Judah. And he says to the tribe of Judah, uh, okay, we've got Judah, we went through Zeri, we're working down through the family. Now he's down to the family of Zerah, and he's down to the family of Achan. And he says, look, Achan, you're the one. What have you done, Achan? What secret thing have you done? Give honor and glory unto Yahweh. Read, Carolyn. May confession unto him. Now you confess unto Yahweh, Achan. Read. And tell me now, what hast thou done? Now what have you done, Achan? Read. Hide it not from me. Now don't go hide nothing because Yahweh is on the present, folks. You can't hide nothing from Yahweh. You ain't fooling him at all. Read. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against Yahweh Elohim of Israel. Now he's confessing, I've sinned. Read. And thus and thus have I done. Read. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment. Now watch what he's done, folks. He saw a goodly Babylonian garment. You don't understand that? Boy, didn't that look nice. You understand that? He saw beautiful, something beautiful from Babylon. Read. And 200 shekels of silver. Now he's got something from Babylon, and he's got 200 shekels of silver. Read. And a wedge of gold. Of and he's got a wedge of gold. Read. Of 50 shekels weight. Read. Then I coveted them. Uh-oh. He starts coveting these things from Babylon. And he idolized it. I never forget the time. One time I was in class, and they said, you know, you ought to see that Billy D. Williams. Is he good looking? Right? I've heard people say that in class, folks. Or Michael Jackson. Ooh. I love Michael Jackson. He's got right or wrong. <laughs> right? That's what. And all of a sudden, they want to be with that person. They covet that person. You understand this principle, folks? So you're seeing that that covetness is a form of idolatry. Right or wrong? You're idolizing that. Oh, geez, if I could just just talk to you understand what I mean or just meet such and such you've got covetousness and idolatry tying together so here's Achan he's coveted these things from Babylon he idolized them read then I coveted them and took them and behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the uh oh they're in the midst of his tent now look folks what know ye not that your body is the tabernacle or the temple of the Holy Spirit, right or wrong? Your body is a tent, right or wrong? And those of you that have studied, you have a membrane over here, it's called your tentorium. You've got a tent here, folks. This is a temporary dwelling. This was temporary, this is temporary. This was a tent, this is a tent. Achan decided to hide something in his tent. You understanding this? And if you did that under the law, you were cursed, right or wrong? Read, Carolyn. They are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. Right in the midst of his tent, he hid it, folks. And I'm trying to get you to see, for those of you that can, apply it under this covenant. Apply it under this covenant. You might be hiding something in your tent. A secret thing that's even a curse. Because you've idolized it, or you've been stubborn, and you've been coveting something. Read, Carolyn. And the silver under it. Uh -huh. And Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. Now they hid that in his tent right in the midst of it. Now swing on down to the end of uh, Achan. What happened to him? Come quick. 21, 22, somewhere in there. 20, I don't know the reference. 25. Go ahead. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? Now why, Achan? Why did you do this thing? Why did you take something from Babylon? And all of you know what re Babylon represents, right or wrong? Read. Yahweh shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones. Now they end up stoning Achan, read. And burned them with fire. And then he burns them with fire to show that you, the Achan, was twice dead. They stoned them, then they burned them, which is really a type of putting them in the lake of fire. Right or wrong? Now look, so you see back here that when you covet something, you could be involved in idolatry. Right or wrong? Now let's. Go down a little bit further. We already read in 1 Samuel that Saul 
who was king up here in Canaan's land. And look, folks, wasn't Adam king? He's got to fall. Saul's the king. He's got to fall. He's the first king here. Saul was the first king in the prophets. Both of them have got to fall, these kings. And, uh, and you would just say, Saul, he's a rotten apple. That's what he was, just a rotten apple. Now what happened to him, Saul, you pick up here that they're going to go out and fight a battle. And they're told to destroy everything in this 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter. We went to the law, now we're in the prophecy. We went over on in there, and he's up in Canaan's land there, you follow? And he's up there, and he takes some things. Uh, swing on down there, I think maybe the 16th, 17th verse in there somewhere, Carolyn, if you could be kind enough. 1 Samuel 15. Be quick. Do the best. 15. And Saul said, they have brought them. What verse are you reading? I don't know if they heard you. 15. 15, 15. Read, Carolyn. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto Yahweh thy Elohim, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now, they were supposed to destroy everything up here in Canaan's land. They were supposed to get rid of that in that battle. Read. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what Yahweh has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Stay on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and Lord. Yahweh anointed thee king over Israel? So he was anointed king over all Israel. Read. And Yahweh sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then, didst thou not obey the voice of Yahweh, but didst fly upon the spoil, and did evil in the sight of Yahweh? So now Saul took the spoils from, the, from that victory, and he's going to covet that stuff, and he's going to try and possess that stuff up there in Canaan's land, folks. Folks, haven't you been taught? you got Egypt, the wilderness, Canaan's land. Look, folks, that's just like these three ages. you got this age, the death, then you got the flood. You come down into the post-Diluvian age, and we're dealing with all these idols in this post-Diluvian age. And you come down into this present age of grace. Look, folks, this is like Egypt. This ended with a flood right here, right? Well, look, folks, don't they come to the Red Sea right here? Look, folks, don't we come over here and we got the, the time of the law being given? Well, that's just like in here in the wilderness of Sinai. Wasn't the law given there from the mountain? We come over into this age here, right? And doesn't Joshua take us over into this age here? Isn't he present and bring us over into this age here? So who's got to lead them on into Canaan's land? But we know Joshua is Joshua, and he takes them on over into Canaan's land, right? So here we are, this present age right here. And Canaan's land right here, tie together, folks. Now we're dealing with an event in Canaan's land, which would be synonymous to an event in this age right here. And what we're finding out is, is that Saul is coveting all these worldly goods. That's what you're finding out. And if you know that this migration here, one, two, three, is the same as one, two, three, you've got to watch what you're doing in this age. You've got to watch what you're doing. So now go ahead and read, Carolyn. And Saul, verse, Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of Yahweh, and have gone the way which Yahweh has sent me, and have the king of Amal Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil. Now see, he tries to justify it and lay down the people. But he's the head. No, folks. The head is responsible. Read. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto Yahweh thy Elohim in Gilgal. But see, they didn't really want to do that with that stuff, folks, to be blunt with you. And they took that stuff and they covered it. So now you come along and you'll find out that Samuel says to him, stubbornness is his idolatry. Well, look, folks, if you look up the word stubbornness or you deal with stubbornness, that's trying to be self-willed. Trying to do it your way and your way only. Look, folks, don't you know, haven't you heard, quote, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. So if you're being stubborn, you're trying to be self-willed, you, you, you know who the idol is? Yourself. Look at folks, they were told not to make any images, right or wrong. Yes, indeedy. Well, look, folks, you know what could be an idol now? This image. You know, this image, we try to get this off the chart, folks, and talk to you about it, you follow. Now, we're in Samuel, right? Go over to 2 Kings, the 17th chapter. Start reading the 7th verse, and please be quick. Go ahead. 
Go ahead and read. Second Kings 17, fifth verse. Yes, go ahead. Seventh verse, Linda. Seventh verse. Go right ahead. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against Yahweh. Now the elements. children of Israel are constantly sinning against Yahweh when they're in Canaan's land, folks. And Canaan's land in this age can tie together. Read. Which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now you all know that, folks. You know how they were brought out of the land of Egypt and brought out of the house of Pharaoh. Read. And worshipped idols. And they worshipped idols. Read. And walked in the statutes of the he heathen whom Yahweh cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel which they had made. Now look, folks, I'll never forget that we asked Dr. Kinley one time, he said, Doc, how come you wear the Star of David? And at one time it was a big craze in the school, folks. Everybody was wearing Stars of David. Don't lie, you were doing it. <laughs> I'm dead serious, people. All the pe everybody had a Star of David, do you follow? And we said to, to Doc, Doc, how come you wear the Star of David? He just turned his head and pick a fight. So in other words, there's a black, you understand what it is? There's a black man wearing a Jewish star, folks. The reason why he did it was to get in a conversation with somebody. How come you're wearing a Star of David? Then he would go on to explain that he was a spiritual Jew under a new covenant, do you follow? That's why he was wearing the Star of David, do you follow? But a lot of people didn't know that. They figure Doc's doing it. Geez, I'll get myself a star and wear it. <laughs> That's right. Don't tell me that doesn't happen. Do you follow? Now, here's the point. We're coming down here, and they've been influenced. They've come out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness, and they've got idols with them. First, Second Kings, the 17th chapter. What verse yet, Linda? Ninth verse. Ninth verse. Go right ahead, please. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against Yahweh. Oh, oh, Yahweh. oh, oh. They did deceitfully. Those things which were not right in the sight of Yahweh. Read. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. Now they end up building up these images, folks. Read. And they set them up images and sacred poles in every high hill and under every green tree. So they, they were all making all kinds of images. All kinds of images those children of Israel were making. Read. And there they burnt incense in all the shrines, as did the heathen whom Yahweh carried away before them. So they were on, these children of Israel became just like the heathen. You couldn't tell the difference between those, those Jews there and the heathen. They all were worshiping idols. Read. And wrought wicked things to provoke Yahweh to anger. And it provoked Yahweh to anger. Go ahead and read. For they served idols, whereof Yahweh had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Now they were serving all kinds of idols here, folks. And see, I was lied to in Judaism. Remember the initial conversation where Michael le left off there and he started talking about the fact that kid went to a synagogue? Well, the Jews were serving idols. Do you follow? And I was never told that. Read. Go ahead, and Yahweh had warned Israel and Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways. And now turn from your idols and your evil ways. Read. And keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers. All right. Now, so he says, Turn away from all that idolatry. Now we've got to hurry. Okay. Now we're going to have to, I'm going to beg you girls to read as quick as you can. Okay. We're going to speed up the pace a little bit now. Okay. Now here we're going over to Hosea. The third, see, folks, if you want to go in the book of Isaiah, he talks about idols there. You, follow. you want to go in the book of Jeremiah? Folks, Dr. Harris requested we show different, con different aspects of this teaching, right or wrong? One aspect of it is line upon line, precept upon precept, right or wrong? We're taking a precept of idolatry. We started out in Genesis. You know what happened in Exodus. We went to Deuteronomy. We went to Joshua. We went to Kings. We went to Samuel. Now we're going over. You know it's written about in the book of Isaiah. You know it's written about in the book of Jeremiah. You know that Daniel deals with that image. I can't even get the chart to it. It's too far away. That, that, that deals with that image over there, right or wrong, or that idolatry in Babylon, right or wrong. Now we've come through all those books. Ezekiel, right? We're running a precept of idolatry, line upon line and precept upon precept. And we're looking at this idolatry. Because this is our schoolmaster. This is our law. We've got to learn from this back here, folks. Now let's go over to Hosea, the 13th chapter in the second verse. Hosea 13 and 2. Right. And now they sin more and more and have made them... Now Israel sinned more 
and more and more. They kept right on sinning, read. And have made them molten images of their civils and idols according to their own understanding. They made idols, folks, to match their understanding. Match understanding. In other words, if they understood that to be important, they made an idol to fit that bill. You catching this or no, folks? If you think you're important, you'll make yourself an idol. You think a dean is important, you'll make him an idol. You'll make an idol to match your understanding. That's just the way it is, folks. Just the way it is. Now we come on down through. Now let's now we've gotten in the law, we've gotten in the prophecy, right? Go to Luke the 16th chapter and the 13th verse. Please be quick. Linda, you be kind enough to go to Romans the first chapter, the 18th verse. Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. Now here's Joshua. He says, no servant can serve two masters. Folks, when you've got an idol, you've got to service it. Say you've got a car that's an idol. Does it need service? Oh, yeah. You've got a house, you follow, that's an idol. You've got to service it. You've got to wash it. You've got to paint it. You've got to fix the roof. You've got to fix the chimney. It's an idol, folks. It can be an idol, you follow? You can take it to an extreme, you follow? You ever seen Robin Leach, The Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous? Oh, geez, I, I idolize a home like that, right? That's what they want you to get you to do. They're showing you kinds of idolatry out there, right? Then you come along, and you might have another idol, you follow? Let's say, oh, there, there's so many idols you can have. They had idols to match their understanding, folks. And if they coveted something up here, it became an idol to them. So you had all kinds of idols back there, right? Now, uh, where are you reading there? Luke 16, 13. Right, go ahead. No servant can serve two masters, uh -huh. for either he will hate the one and love the other. Now, you either love one idol or you hate it. You can't serve two masters, read. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He'll, despise, he'll either love one and then it'll end up hating the other. It's going to be one, you either got to go for the idol, or it's either one or the other, folks. You can't have both. Read. You cannot serve Yahweh and man. Well, mammon, I think, is the word, mammon. isn't it? Now, mammon is an idol of riches. Okay, that's what that basically, if you go check it out when you get home, it's an idol of riches, folks. You can't serve Yahweh and expect to be on TV with Robin Leach and the lifestyles and the rich and the famous. You can't do that, folks. You either got to love one or hate the other. You're either of this world, of the natural, do you follow, or you're going to deal something with the spirit, right or wrong. Now, when you come over under this covenant, and Paul is writing, I guess I'll use this chart, you come across and you come under this covenant, he's just going back and quoting the law here. Romans 1.18. Romans 1.18. Now, just read 118 and go right to 21. For the wrath of Yahweh shall be revealed from heaven. Now look, folks, the wrath of Yahweh was revealed from heaven back here. Because, uh, when they, because that which may be known of Yahweh was manifested in them. The invisible things of him, the spiritual things, were manifested there on the bottom of the mountain so that they were clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that they could even understand the supernal nature. This threefold pattern, folks, was, can help you to understand the supernal nature. Not the planet Golob or whatever, do you follow, that they teach in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that you're going to go off to. You've got to learn about this pattern, folks. Not sing, not be named after it, but you've got to learn about it. Or you will go to the lake, do you follow? Now that sounds bad and that sounds terrible and those are new people, folks. But if somebody's been brainwashed, folks, you've got to hit them hard. Sometimes you've got to give them an electrical shock to get them to wake up, do you follow? And if you're out there, and you're supposed to be out there teaching, and you're not using the name Yahweh and Yahshua, you, you're out there under a false image, or a false idol. And you're going door to door, and you don't use the true, correct names? What do you think you're doing? You follow? you got an idol over there, Salt Lake City, do you follow? Now, look, folks, you're lucky. If you, you couldn't come in this audience 10 years ago, you wouldn't want these people in your organization. Right or wrong? Look at folks, you, you people are now eligible to join the Mormon church. Prior to this time, they didn't want no parts of you, do you follow? 
Now, it's just stupid, you follow, looking at the flesh, you follow. And since they didn't want you, they wanted themselves, so they became the idol. You catching that or no? Now watch. Let's pick this up here. For the wrath of Yahweh is revealed from heaven against... Go ahead and read. Against all impiety and unrighteousness of men. Well, was it the golden calf unrighteousness? Read. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, when they started dealing with this golden calf, they were holding the truth in unrighteousness. Read. 21st verse. Because that when they knew Yahweh... Because they, when they had a chance to know Yahweh and they knew him, they looked right at him, they knew Yahweh, read. They glorified him not as Elohim. They did, just did not glorify Yahweh. They started glorifying an image or a man or something else. Read. Neither were thankful. Neither were they thankful. Read. But became vain in their imagination. Now that vanity ended on up in there. Read. And their foolish heart was darkened. And their foolish heart became darkened. Read. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See, they're involved in idolatry, folks, and they became a fool. Read. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible Elohim into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts that creep in things. Now look, so what they did was they changed those images. Now if you go back, we read it in Deuteronomy. He said, don't make any images in the fish or the sea or the land or whatever. So what did they do? They made an image there. And Paul in Romans is only quoting what was back there in the law in Deuteronomy. He just quoted it, folks. Now, go to 1 John, uh, go to, uh, Carolyn, you go to Acts 15 and 20, and Linda, you go over to 1 John, the fifth chapter, the last verse. Acts 15 and 20. Now, Acts 15 and 20 is another great confrontation of the apostles and those that believed in Yahshua the Messiah. Acts Read. 15 20. Read. But that we write unto them, and they abstain from pollutions of idols. Now, look, the apostles are there, they're gathered together, and they've all come into a conclave. And James is speaking. And he says, look, abstain from pollution to idols. Read on, Carolyn. Abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from blood. Now look, the apostles, you later on read, all concur to stay away from idolatry, which is covetousness, which is stubbornness, which is uh, being self-willed. You can have an image. You make an idol to match your understanding. And then you have to service that idol. And they said, stay away from idolatry. That's all the apostles, right? 1 John 5 and 21. He writes the whole book of John, folks. This is the last verse in the book of John. And every one of us know in here, 1 John, the fifth chapter. There's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And there's three that bear witness on earth, blood, water, and spirit, right? So look, folks, he concludes the whole book. Read. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's how he concludes. Keep yourselves from idols. Now look, folks, I look at myself, fellow. I can see how it's all through the law and the prophecy. I see it in those books in Romans and Acts, do you follow? The city of uh, 17, chapter of Acts was wholly given to idolatry. And I look and I see we're coming into a new covenant. We're under a new covenant. Something's supposed to be written in our heart and in our mind. Well, these are graven images, folks. Listen at my word. Graven images. If you're going to have a new covenant with a new heart and a new mind, something's got to be engraven in that, right or wrong? Ezekiel 36, 24. Now you say you're under a new covenant. You say you're living with a new heart and a new mind, folks. See, and I recognize my own shortcomings, folks. And if it happened to me, I know it could happen to you. You follow? I realized, I, I tell you when I was over in Israel, I recognized that I didn't want to be there. I was stubborn. I didn't want to be there. I was there physically, but mentally I didn't want to be there. Now I look back at it, I see myself in a state of idolatry. And I could be killed for that, do you follow? I realize my own shortcomings, do you follow? And if you're just honest with yourself, I mean be honest, you'd recognize, folks, that you yourself could also be guilty of that. Now here's the beauty. Yahweh has poured out abundant love and mercy upon us, right? Read, Carolyn, and be Ezekiel quick. Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from among the heathen. Now look, folks, that's us. We're gathered from among the heathen. Read. And gather you out of all countries. Read. And bring you into your own land. Now he's going to bring us into our own land, in our own heart and mind. Read. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Now that's what's going on in class, not some physical water, and you cannot be baptized for your dead relatives. He's going to sprinkle clean water upon you. Read. And you shall be clean. 
from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Now look, folks, if you've got the genuine new covenant and it's being written in your heart and in your mind, you've been cleansed from your idolatry. That's you really, genuinely, truly crossing into this age and dispensation. If you're back here, you've still got some idols, folks. But when you cross into this age, you put down that idolatry, that covetousness, that self-willedness, that being stubborn. You put all that down when you cross into this age and this dispensation. Why? Because if you're back here with these idols, folks, what is happening? You're worshiping those idols. Yeah, we never wanted that. Don't you remember what Dennis Volpe concluded his lecture with? You're supposed to love Yahweh with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Isn't that, what it, isn't that what's back there? Let's read it. Matthew 22, 36. And be quick, please. Now look, folks. You know it's in the law that they were to love Yahweh. Right or wrong? Back here under this law, they were to love Yahweh. Back under this old covenant, they were to love Yahweh. Well, they fell short of that. They got involved in idolatry. And they brought some of those same idols into the holy place. Look at folks. When you came to class, you came out of Egypt, but you brought some idols with you. You brought them with you. Don't lie. Hey, slogan, speak the truth, isn't it? You brought idols with you. Now look, folks, if you're going to cross over into Canaan's land, these idols got to be put down and put out of the way. Your goal is to get up here. You've got to put these idols down, folks, and the only way you're going to get over there is to love Yahweh with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, because you have to be born again. Your former self was involved in idolatry. When the whole, you think the Catholic Church, you see the little statues on their cars, you follow, and you look and you say, ah, aren't they stupid? Do you follow? They got the statue facing the wrong way. St. Christopher, right or wrong? Should be watching the road to help them, do you follow? <laughs> right? So you see them involved in idolatry. You know that in the Catholic Church. You look over there at the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, they got the angel Moroni. Like, give me law and prophets on the angel Moroni. Do you follow? You show me law and prophets on... That's a statue. That's an image. That's an idol. Do you follow? You see the world's involved in idolatry. Buddhism. Do you follow? Think about it. Well, I'm exempt. I'm a Christian. No, you're not. You're coveting things. You want to live the life. You want to have mammon. That's your God or the God of riches. Do you follow? You're stubborn. You're self-willed. You're involved in idolatry. Now what you've got to do is put that down, get a new heart and a new mind, which is going to cleanse you, if you follow, from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And what's that going to be? To love Yahweh with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Read it. Okay, Matthew I'm putting down. Matthew 22, 36. Rabbi, which is the great commandment in the law? Yahshua said unto him. What's the greatest commandment in the law? Read. Thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart. With 10%. With all thy heart. Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. No, with all your heart, read. And with all thy soul. With all thy soul. And with all thy mind. With all thy mind. Now look, folks, I would advise you to be very careful about that idolatry. You saw what happened to Achan. Come to class and love Yahweh, folks. And if you love Yahweh, you'll do fine. Thank you for your time. Please be